All persons having business before the Honorable Chief Judge and Associate Judges, now presiding of the District Columbia Court of Appeals, draw near and give your attention. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. This Honorable Court is now in the session. Please come to order. Good morning and um, welcome to the uh, virtual oral arguments for the District of Columbia Court of Appeals, which we're conducting remotely in light of the coronavirus um, pandemic and for public health and safety. Uh, we have three cases set for oral argument this morning. Uh, we're going to hear the first two cases and then we'll take a short recess to reconstitute the panel and hear the third case. Um, so our first case this morning is um, Milhausen, the uh, District of Columbia, I'm sorry, Milhausen, the United States, I apologize. Uh, are the parties ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, Your Honors. My name is Matthew B. Kaplan, and I appear for Appellant Dylan Milhausen. And with the court's permission, I'd like to reserve uh, four minutes for rebuttal time. Um, Your Honor, let me, I want to focus on the, on the Miranda issues. And first of all, let me address the, uh, the, the two issues are whether there was custody and secondly, whether there was interrogation. And let me focus first on the, uh, the, uh, the custody issue. In our view, the trial court correctly found that uh, uh, Mr. Milhausen was in custody for Miranda purposes during the entire course of this interaction. As we discuss in our brief, uh, custody uh, exists, must, must be analyzed under a reasonable per person standard. And custody exists uh, if, if a, there is a restraint on a person's freedom of movement to the degree associated with a formal arrest. Here, Mr. Milhausen was handcuffed, which is a very strong indicator of custody. He was affirmatively told that he needed to talk to the police. He was sat on the sidewalk in an area where he was separated from the public. And he knew that he had just been assaulted in front of witnesses. Um, and he was- Mr. Kaplan, Mr. Kaplan, I, I just mm -hmm. want to follow up on one thing you said. You said he was told he needed to, stop, to talk to the police? Well, there, there was, there was a, 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 a one particular incident, incident before several of the statements where a, 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 a the, the police officer, Cherry, who's the body-worn video camera, is the, 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 the video which we've given the court. Um, he, she says, there's going to be a detective going to talk to you. Um, and she says, he's going to be asking you questions just like we asked you about what happened. And he says, Mr. Milhausen says, do I need to talk to him? And she said, yes. And, and so I mean, she was literally told, he was literally told that he needed to talk to the, uh, to the police. And was that after... Uh, were there any statements admitted that were after that remark? Yes, 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 there were. Um, um, and uh, let me see if I can find the specific um, uh, 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 statement. I believe it was the last two um, with, when he when he said that. Um, I don't have that. It's on page ten of the um, transcript that you provided to us in the limited appendix. You're correct, Your Honor. The question was, right, so we have a detective here, right, and Milhausen, do I need to talk to you? Question mark. Yeah, he's going to come and talk to you. So he, he was literally told that he needed to, that was before statements 27 and 28. Um, but I, I the, the, in one thing which I think is also significant is at the beginning of this interaction, Mr. Milhausen tells the officers, I'll quote, I'm scared. I mean, I think it's very clear that this is not some type of reasonable, you know, sidewalk type of traffic stop where he thinks he's going to get a ticket and be led on his way. He clearly understands that he is going to be there for a long time or any reasonable per person in his situation. Mr. Kaplan, um, mm -hmm. it seems like the handcuffing and being set down on the sidewalk is, is really strong in this show that this was custodial custody based on our cases and other cases. Uh, um, I, I guess, how do you respond to uh, the government's argument to the contrary? I guess, how much farther beyond the, the handcuffing, seated on the sidewalk, um, police asking him what happened, do we need to go in the custody analysis, um, in your view? 
Well, I think you, your, your honor is correct. The cases say handcuffing is a very strong indicia of, of custody. And yes, there can be very unusual circumstance. I think the government identifies two cases in the history of Miranda jurisprudence where someone's been handcuffed and not been deemed to be in custody. But here, I think almost all the, the, the factors, so, so you could have some, an unusual situation where there's handcuffing, but lots of factors indicate the person wasn't uh, being detained. You don't have that at all here. You know, almost all the factors weigh in favor of detention. And, and one of the, the important factors is, uh, you know, the courts found, and other courts have found in a number of cases, that even when a person is, uh, or, or, or that, that, that a key issue is, 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 is uh, whether the person is told that, you know, he's free to leave or that he's not under arrest. And in some cases, even when someone is told you're free to leave or you're not under arrest, that still can be custody for interrogation. But here, there was no indication. Milhausen was not the, the, the trial court correctly noted. He, he was not told that he was free to leave. And okay. Mr. Kaplan, the, the uh, United States argues, though, that in substance, the officers told Mr. Milhausen that he was not under arrest, that they didn't, at that point, they hadn't decided whether to take him into longer term custody because they said, at the very outset, you know, we're going to investigate and then we'll let you know what's going to happen. Uh, and so the, the United States' argument is that is a factor that weighs against custody because he, that, that was an explanation to him. You know, don't think we're, you, you don't take this as a case where we've already decided we're going to take you back to the station. Consider this as a case where we're kind of, you know, we, we've got you temporarily. We're going to control your movements. We're going to see what happened and then we'll figure out what's going on. Uh, do you agree? Do you agree that counts? in favor of no custody, and you just think it doesn't outweigh the other uh, circumstances, or do you think it doesn't even weigh in favor of a conclusion of no custody? I, I think that statement, if it were made totally in isolation, maybe would be, a, would, be, would be a neutral factor, but it's not, it wasn't made totally in isolation. She said, oh, we're going to complete our investigation, but she also told him, look, this guy who you were just involved in a fight with is unconscious. There was an ambulance there taking him away. I think any reasonable person in that situation would have known that he was in very, very serious legal trouble and would not have expected to be. This was not a traffic stop type type situation. This was a, a situation where there was a restraint on Mr. Milhausen's movement consistent with a formal um, arrest. Um, if, if, if there are no more questions on that, I'd like to move to the, uh, to the issue of, uh, of uh, Stonio, that that was what I was hoping to that you would move to. Um, mm -hmm. what, I'm intrigued by the argument uh, that the government makes, really finally parsing out uh, Mr. Milhausen's responses. Um, they they seem to suggest that he answered some questions directly. There were some pauses, although very close in time, while he's seated and handcuffed outside. But then he just sort of rambles, essentially, his own thoughts, kind of stream of consciousness. And those statements, the ones that they rely most heavily on for the bias enhancement, were voluntary and, and therefore not subject to the custodial interrogation. And I, I don't see a lot of support for that argument in our case law other than a dissent in our Jones case, um, which seemed to suggest that sometimes voluntary statements like that might not be subject to Miranda. And I think there was a, a, an 11th Circuit case that was cited. Um, your, your, your Honor, I think that the, the key thing from our view is that this was a, the whole focus of this interaction was on what happened and why it happened. The police start out the, the interrogation, or the, the, that, that's obviously what's up for dispute, up for, up for the issue to decide what was an interrogation, but they start out the, 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 the encounter with saying, you know, what happened? And they ask them a bunch of follow-up questions, and throughout the, the entire 30 minutes, or at least certainly for the first 20 minutes that are, you know, where he made these statements, you know, they're asking what happened. And Mr. Milhausen is basically trying to explain what happened, and, uh, you know, he knows he's in serious trouble, and he's also, he seems to be trying to explain why it wasn't his fault. And, uh, you, you know, uh, the whole thrust of Miranda is that when, when, when someone is uh, in police custody, there, there is a coercive atmosphere and they need the prophylactic protections of Miranda to, 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 to ensure their Fifth Amendment rights. And it just, in our view, it doesn't make any sense, you know, whatsoever to say that 
okay, for 30 seconds, you know, he, 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 he needs protection under Miranda for another 20 seconds. There's no course of that in the and then 20 seconds he does. Um, the, the, the Mr. Mr. Kaplan, I, I, the case is a little more complicated, I guess, than one in which I, I think you may have said something like the whole focus of this conversation was essentially interrogation. And it seems like it's a little more complicated than that because there are some times when they're asking what I think are undisputedly interrogation questions. What happened at the outset, I don't think the government is disputing, was interrogation uh, within the definition of the relevant terms. But then there are some times when they're talking to him about his status as a veteran. There are times when they're checking him to see if he has what he knows. And so there are some other things that I think perhaps you would agree in isolation would not be interrogation uh, during this conversation. Do you agree with that, that some of the uh, uh, questions or comments or discussion during that period was not interrogate, would not be interrogation at least considered in isolation? I, I think it's correct. Um, you know, at one point, she, you know, Officer Cherry asked uh, Mr. Milhausen, you know, did you serve in Germany? And I think if they just met in the street and she said, you know, I was in the, he said, I was in the Air Force and she said, oh, just serve in Germany. I mean, that obviously in isolation um, would not be a police, you know, interrogation. But here, this was a conversation about, I mean, even though those, you know, that statement about Germany that came up in the context, Germany or Europe, Germany is what he said, came up in the context of his trying to explain what had happened. You know, this is not going to, you know, what happened in Germany is not going to happen here. And so, well, you look in Germany, did, did you, you know, have you been in Germany? So, I mean, this was a continuous, you know, conversation. Um, you know, the government makes much of these supposed pauses. I mean, there was, only one significant pause before it's actually before exhibit 27 and that's a 55 second pause and and the reason apparently there's a pause is the officer says to him hold on and she seems to be doing something and then you know they were talking about the incident before that and then they start talking about after this 55 second uh, uh pause they were talking about it after the other statements aside from exhibit 27 there really is no pause uh, before those statements. I mean, this is, I mean, Innes says this, and this court's cases in Hill and Stewart say this, is you don't, the government's position, as I understand, is basically you need to have like a literal question and then an answer to the question. That's interrogation. If you don't have that, it's not interrogation. But that's not what the cases at all um, um, say. Interrogation exists when, you know, the officer says, a police officer says or does anything that seems likely to, uh, or that a reasonable person would think would likely to elicit from a, a defendant something that could be used against him in court. And, 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 and along those lines, I guess I'm sort of curious about your ready concession that asking him about serving in Germany definitely isn't part of an interrogation. I mean, part of interrogation techniques is just is establishing rapport and getting people to talk, right? And keeping the conversation going. And so he's making these kind of cryptic statements about this ain't Germany, you know, nah, nope, this ain't France, I ain't crazy. And then the officer is saying, oh, so you served in Germany, kind of just tell me more, what's going in, what's, what's in your head, man, you know? Um, so I, I'm sort of curious as to your concession that this is not part of the interrogation. Uh, you're right. I, I, I maybe uh, misspoke or uh, I didn't make myself clear. I, I totally agree with what you said. I, I, what, I, what I meant to say was that if, you know, these two individuals had met in a street corner somewhere outside this situation, they started talking about Germany and the, literally the question was, you know, have you ever served in Germany? Um, you know, that in a totally another, in a different context where he wasn't sat in the sidewalk, he wasn't under arrest, he wasn't being investigated for anything. I mean, you literally take that snippet of out of, you know, those two lines out of, out of, this context and put in some other innocuous contact, a regular converse, context, a regular conversation between two people, that, um, you know, would not be an interrogation. But, but the thrust of our argument is you can't do that. You must look at this in context. And in context, exactly what you were saying, I think, was the case, is that, um, uh, you know, this was a discussion of, of, of sort of a one continuous discussion of what had happened and why it happened. And as you well, said, that's, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, that's, a, that's a normal, I mean, both in terms of police interrogation and in normal, the way we converse is, you know, people say, uh-huh, they say, make statements that continue the conversation, and that gets people to, to, to talk. talk. But, but the, there, there are some jurisdictions, there are some circuits, the 11th Circuit, the 4th Circuit, um, the, the, that, that do 
espouse a rule that um, voluntary statements that are non-responsive to questioning um, are, are not subject to Miranda. Uh, it, it, I mean, is your view that that doesn't apply in a single conversation in any circumstance? Um, that, that we haven't adopted such a rule explicitly. We, we have the dissenting view, I think, by Judge Reed and our Jones, the U.S. en banc state uh, case. Um, why, uh, there's never a circumstance, in other words, that in, during the course of even a custodial interrogation, many statements might be non-responsive and therefore not protected under Miranda, or subject to Miranda, excuse me. I, I think the only you know circumstance, and I don't think this court's uh, jurisprudence is really distinct from other courts' uh, 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 jurisprudence on that issue, is you know courts have held, for example, in, in you know in 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 booking situations where uh, a, a defendant is asked, you know, what's your name, what's your date of birth, and the defendant blurt, blurts out something which which you know I I killed him on X day, something that's totally non-responsive. Uh, the courts have held that. That is a that, that's such, such a statement was not induced by uh, interrogation when, when it has nothing whatsoever to do with the statement that was made. That's of course not the case here. I mean, the police started out by asking him what happened. Um, if there are no other questions, I see that uh, my uh, my time has uh, expired. Okay, we'll, we'll reserve your time for a rebuttal. A couple of minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Honors, and may it please the court, Matthew Covert on behalf of the United States. Uh, Mr. Milhausen's bias enhancement should be affirmed because his statements, as we've discussed, uh, reflected in Government's Exhibit 25 through 28, were not the product of custodial interrogation. And his conviction for felony assault should be affirmed because the evidence was sufficient both to, to meet the elements of felony assault and disprove his theory of self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. I'll, I will spend uh, the majority, if not all of my time, discussing um, the Miranda issue, starting with custody. We agree that, that handcuffs are a strong indicia of custody, relying on uh, this court's decisions in, in White, uh, Morton, and Broom. But, but in our view, there is sufficient evidence, uh, quoting White, on the other side of the ledger to, to demonstrate that here, uh, Mr. Milhausen was not uh, in Miranda custody. And I think specifically looking at the, the factors that this court more explicitly delineates in Morton that are relevant in all uh, custody analysis, uh, but, but as well as uh, in situations where a suspect is in handcuffs. Uh, I, I disagree with Mr. Kaplan's uh, suggestion that the majority of those factors weigh um, in Mr. Milhausen's favor. I think at least five of them weigh in the government's favor. Uh, specifically, the, the public setting. Um, this was on a busy street corner of 18th Street and, and Connecticut Avenue. The relatively brief length of the detention. Could I ask you, I guess, uh, there's always a question about factors and whether they, you know, their absence helps one party or which way they weigh. And, uh, you know, one way of looking at something like the public setting is it's not so much that that weighs in the government's favor, it's that it's the absence of something that would have made it even worse for the government. Because if this had been back in a station house, it would have been, you know, uh, sort of uh, an obviously custody. And so what, what makes you uh, take the view, focusing on the first, for example, that that's a factor that cuts in your favor rather than a factor that could have been worse but wasn't, but isn't really on the other side of the ledger for you? Sure. So if I think back to Judge McLeese, I think your opinion in Broome, I believe that was a case where a suspect was in an interaction with police officers in their home, or at least a home where it appeared they had some uh, connection to. I think in that case, uh, the opinion notes that sort of the being in the friendly confines of one's home is something that, that cuts um, against a custody finding. So obviously in public doesn't rise quite to that level of being in your home, but I, I think there is a similar analogy there that, that when the setting is not inherently coercive, when there are people, members of the public milling around. Despite you see, the again, you know, again, if, if all you're saying is, you know, if you have a spectrum and being comfortable in your home is something that weighs in favor of the government, 
And being taken to an inherently coercive location is something that would weigh against the government. Being in public seems like it's somewhere in between and might well be neutral. But moving to the second of those, you were referring to the relatively brief period here. Uh, and I, I guess, uh, do we know how long uh, Mr. Milhausen was in custody before the body worn camera footage, you know, clock starts running? It's a good question, Your Honor. I think the record is silent on that point, but I think there are some reasonable inferences we can draw um, from the time uh, that, that Officer Karkik arrived and had Mr. Milhausen in handcuffs to the time that Officer Cherry arrived pretty soon after Mr. Milhausen had not yet been set down. Uh, that was a relatively brief period, but but the record is silent on that point. Um, so, but let's say, well, assume for a moment that's, you know, less than five minutes. Uh, maybe that sounds like what you're suggesting. It would be some appreciable time, but, you know, maybe not more than five minutes. Uh, what makes you say, so some of the statements that were made here were made about 20 minutes in from when the clock started. Uh, what makes you say that's a relatively brief time for purposes of whether this is a factor that weighs in favor of or against the government? I mean, you can have Terry stops. Uh, uh, many, you know, many Terry stops are shorter than that. There's some that are longer. If you start getting up into the 30, 45 minutes, you start getting into concerns that they're too long. So it wasn't so clear to me that, again, this is a factor that uh, weighs in the government's favor. What, what would you point us to about why 20 to 25 minutes maybe, if you're talking about some of the later statements, uh, that passage of time favors the government rather than not? Sure, so I think I, think I, have, I have two responses to, the, to that. First, I think the relevant inquiry isn't necessarily how long the detention ended up being. Had the government introduced statements that occurred at the 29 to 30 minute mark, um, I think calling it then a 30 minute detention is certainly relevant. Um, but I think- we Well, I, I, that's why, I, that, uh, that's why I was saying that it sounds like there are statements that are were that were elicited that were around 20 minutes in from when the clock started. So that's why I was, you know, picking 20, 25 minutes. As I agree with you, if the detention went on for another hour and turned into an illegal Terry stop after all the statements, that would kind of be by the by. So I'm with you on that, but I'm not sure it's a response to the questions I was trying to frame it to you. Sure. So I think this court's decision in Morales, which is a 2005 case, just it's again a, a custody case and. There, I think a 30 minute um, custodial or what, what was alleged to be a custodial period, sort of a discussion back and forth, I think the court found was a neutral factor. Um, so I think dialing that back, when you're looking at eight minutes here, which is the, the, the minute mark where Mr. Milhausen makes his first inculpatory statements, I think that's certainly sufficiently brief in the context of a normal on the street Terry stop. Um, well, when we're putting they, things in context, do you agree that? Uh... Uh, eight to 25 minutes while cuffed might be viewed as a, you know, more coercive stretch than eight minutes uncuffed. So that, you know, the amount of time seems like it arguably might interact with the conditions uh, that are in play during that time. Sure. I think, I think that's a fair question, but I don't, I think, I think it is important though to, to keep the handcuffing and the amount of time separate. I don't disagree. Why? Well, sure. Why, why, should, why should we separate them? That seems sort of artificial. I, I don't think it's artificial. I think they are separate factors, as this court noted in Morton. And, and so I, I don't disagree with, I guess, the, the baseline proposition that 30 minutes in handcuffs is more coercive than 30 minutes with an officer at your side. Can you I guess explain, what I need to say. I'm, I'm sorry, in, in Morton, did we really say we have to independently examine time and handcuffing? Because I, I have to say, I would think that the time I spend handcuffing would seem longer if I'm handcuffed. So, they, they seem to interact. So I, I And I'm curious I, I, whether we actually said in Morton, oh no, 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 look at the time and look at the factor of handcuffing. No, I don't think the court in Morton says that those factors need to be strictly evaluated independently. All, all I mean to represent to the court, Your Honor, is that they are separate factors. And again, I don't disagree that time spent in handcuffs might be more coercive than time spent uh, not in handcuffs, given, given an equal amount of time. W w what I'm trying to represent is that the time we have here, uh, specifically eight minutes at the time Mr. Melhausen makes his first inculpatory statements, 
up until I, I believe the 19 minute and change mark where he makes his last. Although That's really, it's a really eight plus n, where n is an unidentified number of additional minutes that you'd have to draw inferences about. Can I ask you if I mean I think whether you think of them as separate at some stage of the analysis, I think you agree at the end. Uh, the trial court needed to consider, and we need to consider all of the circumstances together. And if you were going to point us to a case that you think is most like this, where, uh, uh, you know, do you have cases where, let's, again, let's focus for a minute on the cases that are, the, the, the statements that are most difficult for the government. Take the ones that are, you know, 20 minutes plus N in, where the suspect has been cuffed for that entire time. I mean, do you have cases that say statements like that are not uh, made while in custody, or what, 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 what's your most comparable uh, case when you add together the circumstances we have here? Sure. So I think the two federal circuit cases, I agree with Mr. Kaplan's representation, um, and I believe we cited these cases to the court before, um, are the only cases that I've been able to find um, where suspects, uh, despite some period in handcuffs, are not um, in custody. And I think the Forneo Castillo case is probably the closest. In that case, a suspect was in handcuffs for 15 minutes, um, and, and, and concededly, I think there, there are probably two distinguishing facts there. I believe in that case, the suspect was told before he made his inculpatory statements that he was not under arrest. I think we have a comparable statement here, as Judge McLeese, you noted, though, though not expressly. And I think the suspect's inculpatory statements there were made after the handcuffs were removed. And so the government's argument there was once the handcuffs came off, um, to the extent there was Miranda custody at that point, uh, he was no longer in Miranda custody. With respect to the last two statements, uh, what do you make of your opponent's argument that there, in addition to handcuffing, is the aggravating circumstance that uh, the uniformed officer, when asked by Mr. Milhausen, do I need to speak to the detective, was told, yeah. So I, I certainly think that that's a fact that weighs um, in, in Mr. Kaplan's favor, I, I think we, we fall back on our position that viewed in totality, it's still not enough, or, or, or to say differently, the government still has sufficient evidence on the other side of the ledger. And, and I think that that's consistent, I think, with the approach we're asking the court to, to take, um, not necessarily splicing things too finely in terms of question and answer, but looking at the specific situation that led up to exhibits 25, 26, 27, 28, and assessing at that point um, whether Mr. Milhausen was subject to custodial interrogation. Well, Mr. Colbert, um, it does seem like the government, by presenting all the individual clips from the body-worn um, camera footage, you are asking us to splice sort of fine segments of time where there were pauses. And, and um, at least the way I understood a component of your argument is even if there was custodial question, which I know you argue there wasn't. There were points during this, what you just described as relatively short period, where some of the statements were voluntary and non-responsive and therefore not um, subject uh, to Miranda. And um, I think there seems to be a little bit of inconsistency in piecing those two arguments together. I mean, some of um, our court's cases, Mitchell and Stewart and Watson, described longer periods of time where uh, a suspect was deemed to be in uh, custody, uh, where during that period of an hour, hour and a half, a uh, ride to, to the police station, there's sort of a break and, and then they say something that's non-responsive. That doesn't seem to be, if that's your argument, you know, maybe, maybe that's not the argument that you're making primarily, but if that's your argument, that doesn't seem to fit the facts here where we have a really relatively, as you just argued in response to Judge McLeese's questions, a real, relatively condensed period of time where there are some questions, some direct answers, some other responses that according to Mr. Kaplan are related to that general question. and. I thought the government was arguing that some of those other responses about his worldviews were really non-responsive if we found that there was custodial questioning and therefore a custodial interrogation and therefore we needn't be concerned with them either way. So it does seem like you're parsing statements and segments of time. Sure. So, so 
I'm happy to, to sort of address that in, in full as best as I can. Um, I don't think that the government is parsing things too finely here. I think the approach that the government took at, at trial and that Judge Beck took was, was consistent with Miranda's underpinnings, which is, which is to, to figure out what statements of a suspect are the product of the inherently coercive effects of custodial interrogation and what statements, if there are, are statements um, that just have no nexus, no causal nexus to anything the officers are saying or doing. Statements that aren't necessarily about what happened, um, the incident itself, and certainly the, the subject of the officer's questions, at least early on in the encounter, but instead are statements just sort of about Mr. Milhausen's generalized view of the world. I, 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 I have to say I kind of lose you there. So, so uh, the government took the view at trial that the statements at issue were Mr. Milhausen's motive for committing the charged assault, right? That's correct. So they have a very tight nexus in the government's view to what happened. They are the reason what happened happened. The government uh, you know, believed it could prove and did prove beyond a reasonable doubt to a jury. So how, what, I, I get puzzled about why you think the reason for the assault has no logical nexus to the question, what happened? Sure. So, and, and so I think that those two things you just identified are distinct. And so I want to make sure I, I sort of flesh out uh, the distinction. I think there's a difference between what evidence the government is able to piece together after the fact to support, let's say in this case, the application of a bias enhancement. The analogy I, I could think of, though obviously it wouldn't fall under Miranda principles, is if the government had been able to find some hypothetically social media posts from Mr. Milhausen um, that espouse similar views. The government could find those statements and use them after the fact to, to establish some sort of hate-filled motive for his um, assault of Mr. Bakshi. And so I, I don't think the fact that the government used the statements after the fact to, to prove its case means that in the context of the conversation from Mr. Milhausen's perspective, uh, there's, an, there's, in his mind, a nexus between what he's spouting off uh, to Officer Cherry and the officers several minutes earlier asking him pretty generalized questions about what happened in terms of the assault. So just to be clear, it, it, uh, uh, no, go ahead. I, I just wondered, is your view that to have a Miranda violation, the person has to think that they're incriminating themselves? It's a subjective, the defendant has to have a subjective knowledge that they're incriminating themselves? No, I don't think necessarily that's the standard, Your Honor. I, I was just sort of explaining, I think, the, the qualitative difference. Well, no, but I mean, I think Judge Easter's question is a good one because I, I think your point is there was a logical nexus. It's that Mr. Milhausen didn't consciously understand that connection. Your view is he was, you know, he thought, he, he was drunk. He wasn't necessarily thinking at a high level at all. And so, although what he said had a logical nexus to the question, he didn't understand that it did. Isn't that really the gist of what you're saying? I mean, you, 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 you agree. Objectively speaking, his answers had a logical nexus to the question. Is that true or false? Do you think that's true or false? I, I disagree with that, Your Honor. I don't think there's necessarily a logical nexus between... Well, I, I leave aside for a minute necessarily, which is, you, know, you, you think there is not a, a, a logical nexus. I, I, I don't. Our view is that there is no there is no logical nexus between his. So to be very clear, it, 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 you're you're saying that if you arrested a, sus a suspect for murder, and the police say you're under arrest, and they take him back to the station, and you know they don't give Miranda warnings, and they say to the suspect, "What happened?" and the person said, "I've always hated that guy." You say no logical nexus. He was asked, "What happened?" And he's just, you know, reflecting uh, his motives and his uh, antipathies. So that's admissible under Miranda. Uh, is that, is that, is that, am I picking up the position you're taking correctly or am I missing something? I think there is one distinction I would make there in your hypothetical that I think um, is something we, we rely on heavily in our argument. I think in your hypothetical, there's sort of an immediate question of what happened and the response is sort of, temporally and sort of logically directly related in time to the question that was posed. I, th I think- Okay, so, so, so I, I get that possible distinction. So if instead what happened was in my hypothetical, 
the detective says to the unwarned arrestee, what happened? And the person said, well, you know, person A, you know, I did this, I walked here, here's where I was that day. And then, you know, five minutes in says, I've always hated that guy too. You'd say, no logical nexus, that's really a volunteered statement, that can come in. Yes, I think five minutes later, if a suspect without prompting from police questioning decides to spontaneously say something that has so some- So can I ask you, this is a philosophical question. Do you think uh, mental states happen? I'm sorry, I, can you repeat? I'm not sure I understand the Yeah, I, I apologize. It's a very abstract question, but I, uh, you seem to be thinking that what happened means who moved their body which way, and that it's not part of what happened that pers you know, a person thought a thing or feel, f feels a thing. Um, and that just seems like a philosophical, I'm not sure it's, you know, it would be good philosophy, but I think it's uh, 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 somewhat, uh, I don't know, hyper-technical, unrealistic. Uh, if you ask somebody what happened and they say, here's what I was thinking, that's why I did what I did. That's a, a, everybody would understand that as responsive to uh, the general topic of what happened, I think. I mean, it, sure. It, can, I just, can I just piggyback yet. on Judge McLeese's question uh, that you're getting ready to respond to on this whole temporal argument that, that I asked you about and that Judge McLeese is asking you about? What's the best case to support your argument? I mean, because what, what happened here seems to be very close to the hypothetical that Judge McLeese just gave you that here, uh, Mr. Milhausen was asked by the officer Cherry, what happened? We have a really tight time window. Um, so this temporal argument, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm following. Which of our cases most closely aligns with this temporal argument that you're asserting here? Um, so I'll answer the question uh, in, in parts. I don't think necessarily there's a case from this jurisdiction that, that makes that temporal distinction in terms of next, the link between temporal proximity and nexus. I agree that uh, other than Watson, which again, I don't, I don't think is a temporal case, it's more of a lack of nexus between biographical questions and inculpatory statements case. So we have to go out of jurisdiction, I think, for our, for our best authority on that point. Uh, so you're asking us to sort of expand our current jurisprudence on this issue? Yes and no. I think the court already has jurisprudence, and I would point to, point to Watson and Jones for this, that when there isn't a nexus between um, question and answer, the, the inculpatory statement isn't necessarily the product of interrogation. Now, I agree those uh, cases involve biographical questions, so there's certainly a distinction there. Um, but in terms of evaluating temporal problems, yes, I think that is something that um, we're asking the court to I'm sorry. Can I ask you if this, if the, if the initial question from the uniformed officer had been, what's your side of the story? Would you say that the later comments by Mr. Milhausen were, had no logical nexus to the question asked? Yes, but, but there, I think we would rely less on the logical nexus necessarily between well, my question was only about logical nexus. So if you're not going to rely on that, then maybe your answer is no. Well, it, it's yes in the sense that I would still rely on um, the, the intervening topics of conversation that Mr. Milhausen engages um, Officer Cherry with, his request for medical assistance that directly precedes. Why is that? Why, why do, uh, the question of whether A has a logical nexus to B seems to me a question of logic that wouldn't be influenced by whether in between people are talking about, you know, bloody noses or military service. That's just a question of, the, you know, like relevance, the logical relationship between a question and an answer. I, I apologize. I, I think I may have misunderstood your question. I agree in, in your uh, hypothetical that if the question is your side of the story and Milhausen statements, I would agree there's more of a nexus. So I apologize. Well, for, more of, you think it's a sliding scale of logical nexitude, or do you think there is, or it's a binary, either there is a logical nexus or there isn't? Uh, I think it can be both, but, but I, I think, I, I view it more as a spectrum. Well, I, I'm, I, I, I'm not sure how it could be both. I mean, either it's binary or it isn't, so. So in the context of a Miranda inquiry, 
I would agree that it, it's probably an all or nothing proposition, whether there is a link between a question. And so and if, if, if it, it, um, take out temporality for a minute, imagine that the hypothetical is the uniform officer says to Mr. Milhausen, tell us your side of the story. And Mr. Milhausen had immediately responded, you know, they can't get away with that in France and Italy and Spain and, and the other countries he was mentioning. Would you say logical nexus or no? I, I think probably in that situation, um, we would have a much more difficult argument. And, and I would probably say there is, there is a, a nexus between question and And answer. wasn't it, didn't the officer say when talking about the detective coming that they were gonna, that, they'd officer, that the detective was gonna be asking the same kind of questions and get, get your side of the story? Wasn't that the terminology that was used by the uniform in referring to the expected uh, questioning of the detective? That's right, but I, the, the detective never actually um, came and, and questioned. But there are statements, are there statements after that yes, uh, there comment? Are. Yes, there are, to, to Officer Cherry, who was the- So you would think if, the, if those statements reflect the idea that the officers are asking Mr. Milhausen, understand themselves already to be asking Mr. Milhausen uh, for his side of the story, then I think I, I take your answers to be suggestive of the fact that at least with respect to those questions, uh, there is a logical nexus. I think had an officer come and actually posed questions to Mr. Milhausen after that statement about the detective uh, coming to ask those questions, I would agree. But to the extent Mr. Milhausen um, spontaneously makes these statements, not in relation to any questions or any uh, statements or actions by the officers that would prompt him to do that, um, I think well, that's, that's the question, right? I mean, you're, you mean that wasn't what happened in the preceding, you know, n seconds. The whole issue here is whether the reason he made the comments that he made that the government believed proved beyond a reasonable doubt his motive for the assault was because he was asked at the beginning what happened, and then he there was an ongoing discussion, not sporadic, so you know, desultory at times, sporadic, inter, in, uh, uh, interrupted by medical questions at times but kind of an ongoing kind of back and forth conversation about what happened in his side of the story. That's the issue is whether the later statements were or were not the product of, uh, of, uh, all of all of the things that happened. Can I ask you also, am I right in understanding that you are not asking for us to defer to the trial court? This is a question, whether these statements were the product of the, uh, the what is conceitedly, at least at times, custodial interrogation is a question for us to decide de novo, is that right? Oh, absolutely. The standard review is de novo. I do think, and, and I realize I'm, I'm out of time, um, but I'd like to finish answering the question. I do think the court's factual findings about responsiveness, um, I think those are, are factual findings that, that the court would have to review for clear error. I recognize there's some intermingling between those concepts, but I think there's- well, wait, I, what, I, I'm not sure what you mean when you say about responsiveness. You mean you think we should defer to the trial court's conclusion about whether there was or wasn't a logical nexus? No, so I, I, maybe I, I'll try to be more clear. Um, the court, Judge Beck found here that the, the relevant statements that were admitted um, were, were not responsive to a particular question. That's one of the reasons that Judge Beck cites in her findings for, for finding them to be admissible. Well, how is that different from whether they were the product of prior interrogation? That seems like it's another way of saying the same thing. And I thought, you said we didn't need to defer on the issue of whether they were the product of interrogation. So I, so I think in our view, I apologize, Your Honor. Uh, I, I, th I think in our view, th there's a difference between, I think nexus is a component of- No, 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 but my question, I, I, I understand that for sure. But if, uh, you know, uh, the trial court finds as a matter of fact that an officer asked the following seven questions and that the certain amounts of time passed and then the suspect said a particular set of things. And the issue is, assuming there was custody and conceding what's undisputed that some of the questions amounted to interrogation, whether any particular statements were the product of that interrogation, that, uh, I thought you said we don't defer to the trial court about that. And there's no other, I'm not sure what other fact finding there is in between who said what, when, and you know, maybe how intoxicated Mr. Milhausen was, but pure questions of historical fact, sure. But the product question seems, I thought you were saying, is a, is a question for us to know. It is. We agree that the ultimate well, degree of product well, is what else? What do you think is there other than who said what when and uh, um, uh, 
uh, you know, maybe who was standing where and uh, who was intoxicated or, or more or less, but those kind of pure questions of historical fact, what do you think there is in between that and the product question that you are saying we are reviewing de novo? Sure, I, and I won't belabor the point. Um, I think Judge Beck's finding about the Mr. Milhausen statements not being responsive. What do you, uh, do you what he was, I'm not sure what that means. That's why I'm puzzled. Do you mean not caused by? Do you mean not logically responsive? Uh, it, that just seems like an, an, an unclear as to exactly what that means and whether we should or shouldn't be deferring to it. So uh, Judge Beck, unfortunately, didn't elaborate on what she meant by, by non-responsive. So I think we have to, to take her statements at face value. I think the way the government views her, her, her findings about non-responsiveness is one that I think encapsulates sort of a lot of the things we've discussed, the, the temporal nature uh, the, or the temporal link between question and answer. And um, the and I think Judge Beck specifically says that uh, as it relates to the, the group nine statements, which I believe correspond to exhibit. Well, if we can't, if you agree that the logical nexus question is de novo for us, and you think that Judge Beck's comment about not being responsive reflects that, then we shouldn't be deferring to her uh, conclusion, at least in, in total, because in part it is reflecting a legal conclusion that we're reviewing de novo. So I, I don't, I, maybe I misspoke, I don't think necessarily that the, the logical nexus inquiry is one that's de novo. I think the, the product inquiry is something that encompasses a host of factors, logical. Can I ask, can I ask you just, a, just a, about how you briefed it? Is there a place in your brief where you argue that we should be deferring to, for example, the question of whether, the issue of whether uh, Mr. Milhausen's statements were responsive or non-responsive? Uh, no, Your Honor. I, I know we cite authority for the proposition that factual findings should be reviewed for clear error, but we don't argue specifically that, that the court should review um, the, the non-responsive finding for Can, can I just, I, I just want to pin something down. I'm a little confused. I think you said in response to Judge McLeese that the what happened question is broad enough to elicit information not only as to actus reus, but also as to motive and presumably as to intent, right? Motive doesn't necessarily have to be proved, but mens rea does, right? So whether or not, you know, a homicide was accidental or planned ahead, if someone said, I've been thinking about doing this for a long time in response to the question, what happened? You would agree that that is responsive to the question, to uh, use Judge Beck's terminology. Sure, holding other factors like temporal proximity. So I'm, just, I'm just drilling down onto yeah. the, the scope of the what happened question. So, so you have now answered me and Judge McLeese affirmatively saying that's a broad question and it can encompass actus reus, mens rea, motive. I think, that, I think that's a fair, I think that's a fair statement, Your Honor. Okay, so, so this all comes down to timing then. Timing it's so, and- it's, it's only a product of the fact that there are pauses between the multiple what happened questions and, you know, the police telling uh, Mr. Milhausen, you know, one officer says, that's what I need to know, what happened, right? So there are repeated questions of what happened and then subsequently he makes statements and it's just the, the pause, pauses in between that the government is relying on. Is that correct? Or is, am I missing something? Um, I think you're only missing one thing. So yes, it, it's the pauses to the extent that those periods of silence immediately precede Mr. Milhausen's statements. But I think also it's the intervening um, topics of conversation that I think Judge McLeese pointed out earlier sort of on their face don't constitute interrogation, whether it's a request for medical assistance, checking if his nose is bleeding, those kind of things that-, that I immediately thought you had an exchange with Judge McLeese where you agreed that that was neither here nor there as far as uh, interrupting a response to the what happened question. No, no did I, I miss- I don't, I don't think I, I don't think I said, I, I, at least I hope I didn't, because I think that's a, that's a key point for us, that, that the intervening topics of conversation um, which were not interrogation, break that, that, that. So if I say what happened and you start to tell me 
what happened, but then in the middle of it, you say, I think I have a nosebleed, and then somebody says, well, let me check. And then you resume after somebody checks the, the back end of the answer is no longer responsive. Is that the government's position? I think it would depend on the, the length of time that passed, whether there was any period of silence, whether the officer reinitiated that conversation. I think the government takes the view that to the extent in your hypothetical, the suspect reinitiates that conversation after some significant period of time, whether through medical treatment or silence, that, that at that point, the statement would be spontaneous and, and therefore not, not the product of. Oh, so now we're going to the body of cases where a defendant has invoked his right to silence and then initiates. Is that where we are now? No, I, I think spontaneous cases come up in different contexts, whether it's post Miranda uh, uh, cases or waiver cases or post Miranda cases or uh, on the street encounters where, where courts have to figure out whether a, a, a statement is the product of some police interrogation or uh, the statements were spontaneous. Uh, so no, I, I don't mean to invoke the line of cases where um, there's a, a post Miranda warning subsequently volunteered uh, statement. Uh, I recognize I'm, I'm far beyond my time. I appreciate the court's time. Um, and I do apologize for the error on page 29 of our brief that uh, Mr. Kaplan identified yesterday. I apologize for any confusion. Um, so mm -hmm. for, for those reasons, we ask that the judgment of the court be uh, affirmed. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Covert. Is it covert or covert? covert? It's, it's like covert operations. Your Honor. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Kaplan, um, we uh, saved a couple minutes for rebuttal for you. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, on, on this issue of the, the nexus issue, I mean, first of all, I mean, J Judge, Judge McLeese gave a hypothetical, what if there was like a five minute break between statements and, and this discussion of that. I, I think it's important to focus on the fact here, there was no five minute breaks. The breaks were maybe at most a minute, 55 seconds. There were very few periods of, of, of silence. And you know, the topics of conversation were almost I believe literally all of them were related to what happened. I mean, there's discussion of, you know, the, the Mr. Milhausen's medical situation, but interspersed in there is Milhausen was explaining that he had been attacked first, and he seemed to think, and as you know, perhaps intoxicated state, that 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 he had been injured, that he'd been punched, and he was trying to point that out to his officer. Yes, there was also discussion: do you need an ambulance or something like that? But it was interconnected with with. Uh, I mean, obviously, the only reason he would have been injured is because of what happened, but it's also interconnected with him trying to explain why, um, uh, uh, you know, his motivations for what had happened. Um, the government makes an issue that this was in a public setting, but as you know, of course, we point out in our brief, there, there are numerous cases, uh, White and Morton from this jurisdiction, where, as in this case, someone had stopped in the side of the road and that was still found to be uh, a custodial interrogation. And I think it's important to recognize that this was not, you know, this was a closed off, cordoned off area of the sidewalk that he was kept right next to with police officers all around him. It's not a situation where there were, you know, he was not really among the public. The police had isolated him um, uh, from the public. Uh, the government says, well, it matters that this was a very brief, uh, uh, you know, his statements came out. Well, we don't, we don't know how it was a number of minutes. We don't know how many, but, you know, we, we should look at the, Maybe the statements at the beginning of this uh, interaction were not custodial interrogation. Um, you know, I don't think that's consistent with the case law at all. The IJ case, so literally, the statement was made seconds after the police officer, the incriminating statement after the police officer entered the room, and 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 uh, this court found that that was uh, custodial um, interrogation. The issue is not how long it was, but the issue is whether the 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 suspect was uh, in custody for Miranda purposes. Um, and on the Fornia Castillo case, which the government, I think, said was it's probably its best case, uh, you know, that's very distinct. I mean, from this case, I mean, for one thing, the officer told the suspect that he was not under arrest, which obviously did not happen here, uh, that, the, that Fornia Castillo being a First Circuit case. And uh, the other issue, and this was also, I think, in the Ninth Circuit case that they cited, is, is that the, the officers had some kind of reasonable concern or reasonable fear about their safety. I think in, 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 in Fornil Castillo, the, the officer was, was alone, and presumably the suspect could have 
understood that, 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 that the officer was trying to protect himself. Here, that's not the case at all. Uh, there was a multitude of officers. There's absolutely no reason for Mr. Milhausen to believe that, uh, that, that the officers feared that he would attack them. Well, I, I, I guess you lose me a little bit there. I mean, from the officer's perspective, there was reason to believe that he'd been in, in an intoxicated brawl. And so you would think that, I mean, it's not like they had cuffed him in the middle of a, you know, when they stopped him for running a red light or something like that. It, 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 you would think it might be uh, not unreasonable that you would uh, want to uh, cuff somebody who had been acting that way or you had reason to believe they'd been acting that way. So that way, I guess I'm not quite sure I follow that distinction. Well, I think it would have suggested to, to Mr. Milhausen that, I mean, you're, you're right, he'd been involved in a brawl. I think it would have suggested the officers, uh, to Mr. Milhausen exactly that, that he was suspected of being a suspect in, in a brawl. But there was no indication that he was armed, that he had a weapon, or there were seven, eight, nine officers around him. And, and uh, you don't have the same officer safety uh, concerns that you have in the other two cases. Um, and, and even in front of Castillo, the officer unhuffed, uncuffed the individual, and that's when he made his statements. So for all of those reasons and for the reasons that we um, uh, uh, articulated in our briefs, in our view, the uh, judgment against Mr. Milhausen should be reversed. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, we'd like to thank both counsel for your briefs and arguments today and the cases submitted at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Um, good morning. Um, good morning. Uh, council ready to pr proceed in our second case this morning? Yes. Um, uh, which is um, Centronia, uh, the, oh, excuse me, <laughs> Department of Employment Services in District of Columbia. Um, excuse me, Central Nia versus Smith. All right, uh, can you just clarify before we uh, begin um, who will be arguing and how you wish to divide your time this morning? Yes, good morning. My name is Haley Morrison with Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher. I'll be arguing for the appellant, Central Nia. I'd like to reserve four minutes for rebuttal, please. All right. And Ms. How I see Ms. Hallams and L'Oreal Smith. Could you uh, explain? Uh, just share how you intend to proceed. Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, Melanie Hallams on behalf of the Legal Aid Society as amicus curiae. Um, I believe that Ms. Smith uh, is going to um, go first for uh, Ms. Smith five minutes, I believe. And um, Yes. And then uh, the Legal Aid Society would, would argue uh, next for 10 minutes. Okay. All right, thank I'm you. having a little bit of trouble hearing Ms. Hallams. So I think it's a microphone issue. I, I could hear Ms. Smith just fine and Ms. Morrison just fine. Your Honor, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Thanks. Okay. All right, then uh, we'll proceed first um, uh, with arguments um, on behalf of Central NIA. And I would ask um, uh, everyone, if you're not uh, actively speaking, if you could. Um, mute your microphones, um, and um, uh, you can proceed now, Ms. Morrison. Great, thank you. May it please the court. Centronia, the appellant in this matter, provides high quality early childhood education in DC. Centronia is licensed by DC's Office of the State Superintendent of Education, OSSI, and institutes rules that are consistent with OSSI's license regulations. Centronia informs employees that any deviation from procedures required by Aussie's license regulations, such as leaving children unattended, may result in immediate termination of employment. 
And because Ms. Smith, the appellee in this matter, did in fact leave two preschool aged children in her care unattended, Centronia terminated her employment. Specifically, on May 1st, 2019, two children who were in Ms. Smith's care were found wandering the hallway of Centronia alone. Ms. Morrison, are... we're, we're familiar with the record um, and we understand why Centronia um, terminated Ms. Smith's employment, but we're here to determine whether or not Ms. Smith should nonetheless have been eligible for unemployment benefits. Mm -hmm. And the ALJ determined that Centronia had failed to prove misconduct. Um, and the ALJ relied on a uh, regulation 7 DCMR 31210, uh, essentially looking at the proof that Centronia um, had submitted to the court and said, this doesn't amount to sufficient evidence. Um, I'm, I'm struggling to find sort of the response to that analysis in your brief because the brief seems to be framed around uh, a failure to consider or a failure to admit evidence but as i understand it the alj admitted all of your documentary exhibits That's may correct. have considered them to some degree but ultimately determined that under this regulation they didn't amount to sufficient evidence Right, and the ALJ said that as a matter of law that, you know, the, the insufficiency of the evidence was because Centronia didn't have a live witness who was able to testify firsthand. And, you know, in response, and the Legal Aid Society agrees with that conclusion. So I, I think the first thing I would point to is that the Regulation 7 DCMR Section 312.9, and that is the 12.9 because the ALJ looked to 312.10 and said you have the burden of proof and the regulation says in an appeal hearing which was the hearing before the ALJ prior statements or written documents in the absence of other reliable corroborating evidence shall not constitute sufficient evidence to support a finding of misconduct by the director. So I, I guess if we're looking at that, yes. why is it that you think the ALJ was wrong? Do you think that you presented materials that were not prior statements or written documents? Well, I think do you think that there was reliable corroborating evidence? I I'm do. just not quite sure I understand your argument. So I just wanted to let you know right up front, okay. because the brief is framed as a failure to consider, yeah. I, I don't understand how you think the ALJ erred. So the ALJ erred by not considering Ms. Smith's own admission of misconduct, which you know is not hearsay and is long. Uh, can I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's the failure to consider. It was admitted into evidence. But she didn't what I admit. understand the ALJ to have said was it doesn't amount to sufficient evidence. Well, the and ALJ I don't know whether you think that it amounted to sufficient evidence because it doesn't fall under the regulation. It's not a prior statement or written document under the regulation, or it is, but it was corroborated. Um, so can I you, think can you clarify that? Right, so the, right. The failure to consider is that the the I believe that the hearsay or excuse me the admission kind of constitutes this reliable corroborating evidence because when viewed in the body of the other documentary evidence everything okay. is internally consistent so so Miss Smith's I'm sorry to interrupt but I just wanted to in the interest of time Miss mm -hmm. Smith's admission in your view is the reliable corroborating evidence under 312.10 that's correct. Okay, so then what is what is the the primary evidence that Ms. Smith's statement is corroborating? So then Ms. Smith's statement corroborates Mr. Velasquez's statement and the Aussie incident report 
and the notice of termination, which reflects the rationale for why Ms. Smith and the teaching assess assistant were okay. terminated. So why does Ms. Smith's statement corroborate these things? Um, because I read Ms. Smith's, we're talking about the email that she wrote on May 2nd, yes. speaking about the May 1st incident. Correct. And in sub and substance, I read Ms. Smith as saying, yes, something happened, um, but you know, I would never leave my children unattended and I understand the rules and I understand my responsibilities. I don't, I don't read it as an admission of fault. I read it as an admission of yes, something happened yesterday, but not as an admission of fault, which it seems like you would need to be the corroboration of misconduct to satisfy 312.10. So even though Ms. Smith's email said she would never leave a child behind, I read that as her being apologetic about what had happened the day before, because her email does show, say that, I saw the door open. I saw the little girl run out. And then she didn't go after the little girl. And well, then, she also says that her co-teacher was there, right? But also the co-teacher- and, and seemingly, didn't... excuse me, that her co-teacher is seemingly closer to the door, right? So I guess, would you agree that at least it's, the, the statement is ambiguous? That it's subject to interpretation? Well, I guess I don't believe that it's ambiguous as to the underlying facts that two children did in fact leave her classroom and she was, and she herself did not go after the child. She didn't direct the teaching assistant to go after the child. She didn't call down to the front desk to tell them to lock the door. Is it unambiguous that two children left the classroom? So yes, because later she says after um, someone returned the, the, the girl, and then she says, he went back down. He came back two minutes later with a little boy. He right, said, but oh, it's not clear really when little the little, little boy left the classroom. Well, I guess her response Or if he left the classroom and whether he was, you know, because there seems to have been something that happened downstairs. Parents picking up their children outside of the classroom. So it's not clear when the little boy got separated from the class from this statement. Or, I think or that is, do you disagree? Well, I think that's part of the problem because she is obligated to maintain, you know, awareness of where these children are by sight and sound at all times. So she, by not expressing any kind of knowledge about what happened with this child, that itself is evidence of the misconduct because he is in her responsibility and you can't have children just wandering around. Well, she, always of, with of your course. Affairs. And, and there's a reason, you know, that the employer is, is, certainly within its rights to, to terminate her. But as far as misconduct and fault, right? I mean, if, if hypothetically, right? We have no idea if this happened, mm -hmm. but if they were coming in from the park and one of the parents had arrived and grabbed their child without telling her, um, she, she talks about doing head counts. So maybe right after she does her last head count, the parent is in a hurry and disregards school policy to sign children in and out and just grabs their child and walks off with them. Mm -hmm. Do, would that be misconduct on Ms. Smith's part? I mean, I don't know necessarily about that specific fact pattern, but I don't think we have to speculate about that because we have the email from Mr. Velasquez, which explains how he found the two children wandering alone in the hallway. And there's no reason to disbelieve Mr. Velasquez's statement. Can I ask you back? Ms. Morrison, I, I wanted to jump in uh, as well with a, with a, a couple of questions, if I, if I could. Um, the, so you, are you um, um, going to come back to the other argument about the ALJ not crediting your uh, evidence because it was no corroborating witness? If so, I can ask that question in a, in a minute. But I guess my, my, my focus of interest 
um, is, are you saying that your primary argument here is that the trial judge didn't credit the quote unquote admission or what you say was an admission by the defense? Because I think uh, as, as I'm, when I'm going to from your responses to Judge Easterly's questions, that, that, that there was uh, some factual issues that the ALJ had to weigh in order to determine whether or not it, it was in fact a party admission by Ms. Smith. And if the ALJ was in their right to uh, weigh that and then determine that it, it didn't amount to an admission, then aren't you left with the, the, the regulations, um, 312.89 and 10, which the ALJ seems to have followed here. Right, so under Compton, the, the, the Court of Appeals has previously said that you know, hearsay is admissible, may be admissible, and that the, you know, the weight applied to each piece of evidence, hearsay evidence, is based on its truthfulness, reliability, and um, credibility. And How does that jive with the, these three regulations, 312.8, 312.9, and 312.10? Because you, you, I did not understand your brief to make the argument that the regulations were misinterpreted. Well, the ALJ just simply didn't conduct any analysis about this documentary evidence. She simply said and faulted Centronia for not having a live firsthand witness to the misconduct. But to I'm ask you a question about, again, the, the ALJ may not have explained its in, uh, the interpretation, but the one way of reading 312.10 mm -hmm. is that if you want to introduce sufficient evidence to support a finding of misconduct, you can't rely solely on prior statements or written documents. You can have some of them, and there can be admissible under the general rules for admission of hearsay or out-of-court statements in administrative mm -hmm. proceedings. Yeah. But you've got to have something that is corroborative and that isn't itself a prior statement or written document. Do you think, do you think that's the, the correct way of reading the regulation or an incorrect way of reading the regulation? I think that's an incorrect reading of the regulation. And I'm drawing on Compton, which is a case that was decided by the Court of Appeals after these regulations were promulgated, which says that- Compton is not an um, unemployment benefits case. But it does speak to so the, these regulations I, don't apply in Compton. Is that correct? Just, um, well, I think Compton speaks more broadly to the evidence in administrative hearing proceedings. But in RB versus um, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, which is an employment benefits case, it does cite to Compton, and it does emphasize that although there may be some stress placed on live testimony, the purpose of that is to allow for cross-examination by the adverse party. And here, there's no dispute that Ms. Smith did not attend the hearing. So to the- And, and just so, so back to whether, to leave aside its purposes, I mean, I guess it's an interesting question whether if a rule has a reason, but its purposes wouldn't have been met and ALJ is free to disregard the rule. But um, so as I understand it, if you, as you understand in this reg, if, uh, uh, somebody wants to prove misconduct. And we'll leave aside a minute compliance with 312.9, which seems to say you've got to bring a live witness as a sort of a separate requirement. But if you're talking about sufficiency of proof, okay. uh, and, and so someone is trying to prove misconduct, and typically an employer is trying to prove misconduct. And it, let's say there had been two different written statements by Mr. Velasquez about what mm -hmm. he had seen. Your view would be, uh, the, the, the employer could call no live witness, relative to this regulation at least, could call, call no live witness, could introduce both of those two separate statements. And if they were consistent, an ALJ, if it chose to, could say, well, I mean, I have one prior statement slash written document, uh, and I have another. And uh, each one of them is consistent with the other, and so I'm going to kind of take them together as mutually corroborative and so um, uh, the, they, there is sufficient evidence. That, am I right that that's how you read the reg? I mean, I think that would be an extreme position on the reg to say that you could have two statements by the same individual, that they would be self-corroborating. But in this case, you know, we have Ms. Smith's email, we have Mr. Velasquez's statement, 
an investigation by the human resources director. So there are multiple pieces of evidence here that are internally consistent. And there's nothing on the other side of the evidentiary ledger, right? There's no rebuttal. There's no evidence on the other side of this evidence. How does that factor into 312.10, right? Because my understanding is insufficient evidence doesn't become sufficient just because the other party doesn't put on evidence. No, I, under, I agree with you there, but to the extent that it's not challenged or corroborated, then I think when you have multiple documents that are internally consistent, they're contemporaneous at the time, there are other indicia of reliability as to those documents, then you can have sufficient, sufficient evidence to support a finding of what, what was the other indicia of reliability about these documents here? Each one was hearsay, wasn't it? They're all they are hearsay, but they were contemporaneous at the time of the incident. Mr. Velasquez's statement is so you're right saying that they fall within each document falls within an exception to the hearsay rule, and therefore they the, the they would be sufficient to prove at least the initial prima facie showing. Um, yes. Go ahead. Yes, I do think that's right, but I also think under Compton, hearsay can be the weight that is placed on the hearsay is based on an, an evaluation of the kind of truthfulness um, and like other aspects that kind of give comfort about the reliability of, of those statements. Can I, can I ask you, I, I, I want to say, I want to make sure I understand I think you said right to something that the chief uh, judge asked you, and I want to make sure I understand your position. Uh, I, I, I thought you might have suggested that you think even a single written document or prior statement could be sufficient evidence if it were properly admissible under the rules of hearsay. So is that your view? It, 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 so take a hypothetical. Imagine that um, there was an authenticated statement written by an employee that said, yes, I engaged in the misconduct at issue and here's what happened and I was, you know, I agree that it was misconduct. Um, but that's the only evidence the employer introduced. Under the reg, would that be, could that be sufficient evidence? Assume again that it would be admissible as an admission of a party opponent uh, and imagine that it by itself it established all of the requirements of misconduct if credited. But it's a single document, a single prior statement, single written doc document, whichever way you look at it. Uh, could that be enough under the reg or do you acknowledge that it could not be under the reg as the reg is written? As the reg is written, I think that's a hard position to take. And can I ask you, the, the relatedly, you, when I ask you whether two prior statements for, uh, written by a single author mm -hmm. could be viewed as sufficient under the reg, because each would be, or you could pick one of them as the primary evidence and the other as the reliable corroborating evidence. You said that might be difficult. Uh, but does it matter how many authors there are, or does it matter how many uh, actual percipient witnesses there are. So again, imagine that uh, there was only one witness who saw the, an incident that's allegedly misconduct. And that witness told you know, Mr. A and Ms. B about it. And there was a written statement from Ms. A and Mr. B and the employer doesn't call the percipient witness and just introduces those two prior statements. Uh, okay under the regulation as su sufficient evidence or not? I do think that in with that example, that would be sufficient because I don't think you could prevent an employer right where there's only one witness to misconduct. From well, how, how could, well, you could have even call the witness, but that seems very odd. If, if the percipient witness in the earlier hypothetical wrote two statements, two different ones on two different days, you'd say not enough. But if, uh, you know, gave uh, the same statement to two different people on two different days, and they added a layer of hearsay by writing a document recording that statement, you'd say that would be enough. That seems puzzling. Oh, I'm sorry. Then going back to think to the first example of the, I guess I wasn't understanding kind of the hypothetical, but in the first one, right, there are two statements by the individual submitted separately, I, kind of without this layer of report. I do think that would be sufficient. I guess I was thinking of if you had someone who was preparing a statement like just for the purpose of the hearing, 
Um, and I don't know also if that is what this regulation contemplates, if someone is submitting a witness statement for the hearing, that in that situation, the reg is looking for additional corroborating evidence of that kind of witness statement. What, what Ms. Ms. Morrison, you mentioned that um, you thought uh, we get some clarification of the reg's intent or meaning by a subsequent case, uh, Compton, I think you said, that came out after these regs. Um, right. Does, does in, your, in your view, could you explain what you mean by that? Do you think Compton clarifies what the regs are along the lines of what you just suggested, that it's, it's, it's meant to avoid having someone manufacture essentially a statement just for the hearing? Or is there some language in Compton that you rely on or the holding there to, to support your view that it means something different than how we're reading the language of these regulations? Well, I think as Judge Easterly does correctly points out that Compton is not an employment benefits case, mm -hmm. um, but RB versus US um, Environmental Protection Agency is an employment benefits case and does rely on Compton. And um, the, the other thing I'd say about both of these cases in terms of the court's acceptance of hearsay as a, as a basis for um, a finding of misconduct, I, I want to kind of draw that back to the reasoning for having um, kind of live testimony. Um, and the, so these cases provide that you can make substantive findings of misconduct um, or substantive findings in an administrative hearing based solely on hearsay. Um, do, do those cases, just, just to clarify from for my understanding of your, your argument, those cases don't relate to these specific regulations. Or, or do they? Are you arguing that they do? Or, or are no. you arguing that they... So you, what do we do with these regulations, I guess, is where I, I get stumped. Uh, can we ignore them? Uh, are we supposed to re interpret uh, what we mean by them? Because I think you're not disputing that the, the ALJ followed the letter of these re re regulations well, by, not, by disallowing uh, under uh, 3.312.8, um, 9 and 10, there was no testimony and there was only the hearsay documents. So if I could just speak to that. What should the ALJ the should have done differently, is, I guess, in your view, is what I'm trying to. Well, well I think there's a misreading of regulation 312.9. Okay. Um, because the ALJ said, you know, she can't make a finding as a matter of law of misconduct because there was no firsthand witness. But 312.9 says, the persons who supplied the answers to questionnaires or issued other statements alleging misconduct shall be present and available for questioning by the adverse party. There's no requirement that, this, that these individuals prevent affirmative testimony of misconduct. The purpose is to provide the opportunity for the other person to cross-examine this well, witness. Wait a second. Were they present? Were they present no, they and were. available? Ms. Smith, Ms. Smith did not attend the hearing. Her counsel did not attend the hearing. She didn't present any evidence. No, no, no. Were the, were the never... witnesses who provided the answers present and available? That's how I would read that statement. You're saying... Well, I guess our position is the witnesses with the firsthand knowledge of this conduct were not present. Harmless error because Ms. Smith wasn't there to question them. Can I ask you, is it your view, I mean, is it your view that essentially that's a waiver of 312.10? So that if, if you are an employee and you choose not to go to the hearing, uh, that the sufficiency rule stated in 312.10 is waived. Is that your point? So the ALJ could say, well, it's true. I've only had one hearsay document for by the employer, but the employee isn't here. And there's a rule that this isn't sufficient evidence, but that's waived if the employer isn't, if the employee isn't here, because the only reason for that rule is so that the employee can question uh, uh, a declarant. Is that, is that your position? No, that's not. I mean, I think the employee waives the, I mean, I think if the employee is not present, that makes it not fatal if the firsthand witness is not available for testimony. 
because well, right, I know what is the, the, the ALJ did not rely on 312.9 as fatal, so it's a little bit academic uh, for current purposes whether that was correct or not correct. But um, if I mean, this is a sufficiency rule, and we do have cases that say that even if the employee chooses not to be present at the hearing, that well, if that happens, the employer is not lifted of the obligation to introduce sufficient evidence of the misconduct. And so I'm just not sure why Ms. Smith's uh, not being present at the hearing is of any relevance to whether the requirement of 3.1210 uh, was properly interpreted and met. Why is it relevant at all? Well, so it's relevant because although the ALJ does discuss 3.1210 in her paragraph, she says, as a matter of law, she says that essentially it can't be proven or proof because there's no employer witness with knowledge of the purported misconduct. Right, and what I took that to mean, I, I took that as the AL, it's, it, it, you're, it's an, an inference, I guess, but I took that as the ALJ interpreting 3.1210 to mean that there's no way to introduce sufficient evidence unless you have a live witness because what you need, their prior statements are written documents, and you can put some of those in, but if you want to get some su su uh, sufficient evidence, you need to do, you need to have some other kind of evidence. You need to have uh, a video or a live witness. I mean, that live witness isn't the only way, but you could have a video or you could have something else other than just prior statements and written documents. I, that's what I sort of understood the ALJ to mean, and we've been discussing whether that's right or not right, but you think yeah. there's something else going on than that? Well, I mean, I do think it's kind of an implicit reference that to 312.10, but in this case, she kind of imposes a de facto requirement that there must be a firsthand witness by the employer, and the regs don't require affirmative testimony by, by an employer's witness. I'd say this is a trap for the unwary. Like, if you have to have a firsthand witness, um, then that should be in the regs. I mean, all of these, the cases that discuss administrative hearings and RB, which does focus specifically on employment benefits, talks about how hearsay can be admissible in NBC. But, but in this evidence. context in particular, you have a reg that says in 312.8, no misconduct shall be presumed, right? And so right. the employer has the, the burden of proof, right? The absence of facts which affirmatively establish misconduct um, shall relieve a complainant from offering evidence on the issue of misconduct. So, right. if, so if the employer doesn't put forward sufficient evidence, the employee has no burden, right? Then 312.9 says, you know, you, the, the persons who supplied the answers to the questionnaire or issued other statements alleging misconduct shall be present and available for questioning, but don't have to be questioned, right? And 312.10 says in an appeal hearing prior statements or written documents in the absence of other reliable corroborating evidence that you can bring reliable corroborating evidence shall not con constitute sufficient evidence. And so I guess, I mean, this isn't all about cross-examination here, right? This is about unemployment benefits and we have a safety net. And so we want to make it kind of hard to disqualify people from getting unemployment benefits. And so we require the employer to put forward their proof before the fact finder, regardless of whether the employee can cross-examine them, because we assume that employees are not legally trained and are not going to be able to, you know, skewer the employer uh, witnesses on the stand, right? We're relying on the fact finder to make the requisite findings of fact based on the proof that's put before the fact finder. Mm -hmm. so, do, do you disagree with that? I mean, I agree that Centronia maintains um, the obligation to prevent, to present sufficient evidence of misconduct, but I, I think it goes a bit far to say that, um, like in, in this situation where all of the evidence is internally consistent and there's an admission by Ms. Smith, that the evidence is somehow not sufficient, where the ALJ did not make any findings of fact or make any analysis about these documents. Because the, her analysis is that 
you know, it's because Ms. Jenkins, the human resources officer, doesn't have firsthand knowledge that she can't consider any of the other evidence that's presented. Will you Ms. agree that Ms. Ms. Jenkins didn't have firsthand knowledge, right? So she did not have firsthand knowledge of okay. the misconduct. And so I just want to get back to where I started. So I think at the beginning of the argument, you said, look, if we're looking at the regulation, it's Centronia's position that the primary evidence of misconduct is Mr. Velasquez's statements that are in the statement that bears his name. And then those statements are kind of incorporated into the Aussie report, right? I mean, it's, so, so that's your primary evidence. And then your corroborating evidence is Ms. Smith's statement. Is that really reflected in your brief? I thought your brief flipped it and said that Ms. Smith's statements were the primary evidence and that the employer's other documents were the corroborating evidence. I think the point in the brief was intended to say that Ms. Smith's admission is kind of this foundation, this core, this like reliable core and corroboration, corroborating evidence that does corroborate the other documentary evidence that was introduced. So because we have Ms. Smith's admission and her email describing the facts of what happened on that date, that gives us kind of trust. There's trustworthiness and reliability for these other documents. Um, that were generated contemporaneous at the time. And so that, because of Ms. Smith's admission, we can then trust these other documents as well. And that those, when you also look at those other documents, they have other indicia of reliability, namely that they're internally consistent, they were created at the time. You know, these were not documents that were generated for the purpose of the OAH hearing. You know, the Aussie incident report, I mean, it's, it's against Centronia's interest. So it doesn't matter so much that they're hearsay or not hearsay. You ha can have a sort of a broader assessment of reliability under this regulation. Because the regulation doesn't actually say anything about the rules against hearsay. No, that's correct, right? And the case law does... I mean, we'd be throwing out all of this court's case law um, precedent about accepting hearsay in administrative hearings if we read the regs to require or to say that you can only have, you know, firsthand live witnesses or, or video evidence. And that's just not consistent with all of the case law. Um, well, the reg doesn't have to be consistent with our case law about what the ordinary principles of evidence in administrative proceedings are. The reg can be a more, and it's, it's been recognized as a more stringent requirement applicable in this setting for particular policy reasons. Right, but I think that subsequent case law that's been um, interpreted in employment benefits kind of con hearings, like still does rely on um, mm -hmm. rules about hearsay that you can accept hearsay in administrative hearings, specifically unemployment benefits hearings. Um, so Are I you talking about Cooper? Yeah, for sure it's admissible. I mean, nobody's saying it's not admissible. There's a special right. rule about sufficiency. Uh, that, that, and the issue is how to interpret that regulation, which I find a bit unclear, I would say. Right. I do think the, this rule is challenging, but I don't think that it's correct to read into this requirement that you have to have a live firsthand witness. That the ALJ, that was the basis for her decision, was that Ms. Jenkins, the human resources officer, didn't have firsthand witness, and then so she threw everything else out. She didn't look at it. She made no analysis of the other evidence or Ms. Smith's admission. Um, so that, I think, is the core fault um, in the ALJ's decision. All right, Ms. Morrison, thank you. We, we've, we've taken you over your time with our, our questions and appreciate your responses, but we'll still uh, reserve a couple minutes of rebuttal time for you. Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Smith, I, I believe um, uh, you indicated that you were gonna speak for about five minutes and then Ms. Hallams was going to, um, to use the remainder of that time, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, if you could just, um, State your name uh, for the record, and then you can share your statement with us. Um, my name is L'Oreal Smith. Um, I feel that I was falsely terminated from Centronia off of a situation that was out of my control. Being a, I take my job very seriously. It hurt me more than anything when I wasn't able to speak to my students, my parents, before departing, like 
I will never put a child in harm's way or make a parent feel that their child is not safe in my care. Working there, it meant the world to me. They was like family. But after them saying that I had let a child out of my room hurt me more than anything. I would never harm any of my students or let them be in harm's way. Being a teacher means everything to me. And I feel that this should not, this situation or should not define the person I am or the educator that I am. Thank you so much, Honor. I'm finished. All right, thank you um, for your statement and for uh, appearing here today. Um, Ms. Hallams. Good morning, Your Honors. Melanie Hallams on behalf of Legal Aid Society, his amicus curiae. Uh, first, I wanna thank the court for allowing the Legal Aid Society to participate in oral argument today. And employment benefits are designed to protect employees who have lost their jobs and to reduce the need for other welfare programs. So even if employees do something for which they may legitimately be fired, it is only in extreme and willful situations that unemployment benefits are taken away. And that's the reason why employers must meet a higher burden in misconduct hearings before taking away this safety net. And here, Centronia did not meet its burden of proving misconduct. Despite Ms. Clear Ms. Ms. Hallams, I, you know, one of the things you can see we're, we're grappling with here is um, these regulations are, are a little puzzling to us <laughs> um, because it, it does seem when, when I read the order of the um, ALJ that the ALJ followed sort of the letter of these regulations um, is, is, is legal aid what is legal aid's position? Are you, are you suggesting that the regulations weren't followed, were misinterpreted, or are not relevant due to our broader case law as Ms. Morrison is, as I've understood Ms. Morrison's arguments? Because I, 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 think, I, I don't think we dispute some of the underlying um, reasons for um, unemployment compensation workers' compensation um, and, and the reason for the statute as, as being much different than you laid it out. Um, yet we have these regulations. To, um, which, which, you know, put the burden on the employer. Um, but in some ways they do seem perhaps inconsistent with evidentiary issues in other administrative contexts. I mean, there are some instances where um, perhaps you could have hearsay testimony that falls into an exception that by itself would be enough. Um, but that's not what the regulation seems to suggest here. So I guess so more of a statement eliciting your views as opposed to a direct uh, question. Legal aid society, the ALJ did get it right in this case and applied the regulations that are pretty clear, actually, just in terms of requiring the employer to meet a higher burden in the context of misconduct hearings. Um, the presumption is that the employee is entitled to benefits unless the employer is able to show by preponderance of the evidence that they are disqualified. And when they allege that they're disqualified based on misconduct, then the regulations make clear that they need to prove that and they can bring in a live witness and they could, they could bring in a hearsay. They have but to bring a live witness in to get, to, to jump right in and get to Judge McLeese's question from earlier, right? Do they, do they have to have a percipient witness? Well, the regulations clearly say that, that the person alleging misconduct shall be present. Um, so I think that it's clear that, that they need to have a, a witness who has, um, who is, who is making standing by the statements of misconduct. I think this well, is, how, but, but, the, but the regulations could have said, um, you must have testimony from a witness who has firsthand knowledge. Um, I mean, what, what's the purpose of having someone present? 
if they're not going to testify, I guess, or, or available to testify? I mean, is it that the I see a distinction between a, a regulation that would require the testimony of a live witness as opposed to uh, someone just sort of sitting and standing by if there's no real question presented by the documents. Your Honor, I think that goes back to the burden on the employer. It, it, it's the employer's burden to prove misconduct. So in order to do that, misconduct um, is not just a simple violation of a rule. It is some right. intentionality. No, no, I agree with that, but just sort of procedurally, how does that work here? If, if, if um, the employer here had bought some of the firsthand witnesses and they were sitting in the um, hearing room and they presented their documents, um, there's no one there to question them. Uh, Ms. Ms. Smith was, was not there. So, so then what? Well, it at least would allow the ALJ as the finder of fact to ask questions if the ALJ needed to clarify anything. And I think that looking at 312.9 <coughs> in combination with 312.10, the idea is whether there is reliable evidence to show that an employee should be disqualified based on misconduct. And the misconduct- Can I zero right into, I mean, to me 312.9 is a bit of a, uh, red herring is too strong of a term, but it's a bit of a distraction. Assume for a moment a hypothetical where the employer had called, had brought the live witnesses, and the ALJ, you know, um, could have exercised, and the employee either didn't call them or didn't show up, and the ALJ therefore would have had an opportunity to uh, uh, try to hear from the recipient witnesses who showed up, uh, but chose not to. And so all there is in the record are some prior statements and written documents. Um, so imagine that's what happened. So then we're really only trying to figure out how to interpret 3.1210. Uh, do, do you agree first that the ALJ seemed to interpret it to mean that it doesn't matter how many prior statements, written statements you have, doesn't matter uh, or prior statements you have, how many written documents you have. If that's all you have, as a matter of law, your evidence is insufficient. Do you, do you think that's what the ALJ's opinion reflects as an understanding of the law? No, Your Honor, not exactly. I, I think that the ALJ was saying that in this case, when, when the two, um, two, hearsay, two hearsay statements that Centronia was relying upon were not corroborated. Well, what, what, when the ALJ, I mean, the ALJ at the end said, because there is no live witness, I conclude as a matter of law, that the evidence is insufficient. So wh where, where in the ALJ's order do you see the language that suggests that the ALJ's view was not a general interpretation of the regulation, but instead was kind of a case specific, well, maybe in some cases prior statements and written documents could be mutually corroborative and reliable, but I just don't find it here. Where, where would you point us to in terms of understanding the rationale for the ALJ's order? Well, um. In the appendix 156, towards the end of the ALJ decision, he, um, she specifically cites 312.10, as Your Honor mentioned earlier, and says that in an appeal hearing, which is the context that we're in here, prior written statements or written documents in the absence of other reliable corroborating evidence is not sufficient to support a finding of misconduct. Well, that's just a statement of the general reg. And then when the, when the ALJ goes on and says, here's why I'm concluding what I'm concluding in this case, it is, well, Ms. Jenkins couldn't corroborate the documents. Correct. But that doesn't really address the question of whether the documents themselves were mutually corroborative and reliable. Um, and then there's the, the final paragraph, which says, because no employer with, with firsthand knowledge appeared to testify, I will not, as a matter of law, conclude that the employer carried its burden of proof. Nothing about, well, you know, when I look at these documents, they just don't have the characteristics I would require for prior written statements, uh, prior statements or written documents to be mutually corroborative. There's just no analysis of that or discussion of that. Well, I think that by saying that Ms. Jenkins was not able to corroborate the documents, the ALJ was saying that, and we have to st take a step back. Well, I'm sorry, the ALJ was not saying anything about whether the documents themselves were mutually corroborative or reliable. Mm -hmm. No, but the ALJ said there was nothing to corroborate the documents. Um, right, but the and, issue is, so let me just, so that's one set of questions, which is how do you understand the ALJ's order? But let me turn to how you understand uh, uh, 312.10. Is it Legal Aid's view 
that uh, you could have 72 prior uh, uh, statements and 48 written documents, and they could be all admissible as a matter of the general rules of evidence in, you know, in court. Um, and they could all be as reliable as you like. They just can't categorically qualify as substantial evidence because the reg requires that the other corroborative, reliable information not be a uh, 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 prior statement or written document. Well, in that case, uh, no, I don't think it's uh, that that here that prior statements can never be substantial evidence, but there has to be some some reliability and corroboration attached to all of those documents. So if you had a pile of hearsay, all corroborating the other documents, like maybe more similar to the James case, um, that might get closer to meeting the employer's burden. But well, again, I, I'm asking you a, a, a legal question. And, that is, and I think your answer to my legal question is yes, but let me try again to be clearer and simpler. Uh, can, for purposes of this regulation, can the other reliable corroborating evidence itself be the other and only other reliable and corroborative evidence itself be a written statement or uh, 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 a prior statement or written document? Well, I think for the regulation to really mean anything, hearsay is not supposed to corroborate other hearsay. But if the- well, so I, Again, are you saying I, uh, is that uh, you think it's a really, a, it's a binary question. So either it's possible that the other reliable corroborating evidence would be, the only other reliable corroborating evidence would be a prior statement or written document. That's one answer. The other answer is no, it, that no matter what, that can't be true. And I'm just trying to figure out whether you think it can never be true or you think it could be true sometimes, but isn't always true. Uh, it's a very, really a very simple legal question about how you interpret the reg, and I, I, I don't. I'd really like to get your answer unequivocally as to whether you know, to that question. I think if the if the prior statements are corroborated by reliable statements, by other other reliable statements, other reliable statements, then that could be sufficient. Okay, thank you. But, thank you. And what makes the other statements reliable meeting a hearsay exception? Is that because um, the regulation doesn't say anything about hearsay? No, it doesn't. In in this case, there it's just prior statements and documents. That's what the regulations are talking about. Um, well, it says corroboration by reliable. Um, re well, it says in the absence of other reliable corroborating evidence, whatever that is. Right. I mean, in this case, there is clearly none. I think in a case where there are other reliable corroborating evidence might be a sworn statement, a statement that had been subject to some kind of cross-examination, a prior deposition statement for or prior deposition testimony, maybe as Judge McLeese said earlier, um, a videotape could be corroborating evidence. In this case, there's, there's none of that. There are two hearsay statements that are not corroborating well, your opponent argues that one of them isn't technically hearsay, as that term is used in the uh, Federal Rules of Evidence, and uh, I guess uh, by this court sort of following along behind as a matter of the common law of evidence. Well, first, you know, the, um, the email, I, I believe you're, you're talking about the May 2nd email from Ms. Smith, um, and that was admitted here. It's not a question of admissibility uh, under the Federal Rules of Evidence. But you know, even looking at that statement, there's, there's not an admission of misconduct in terms of the legal burden that Centronia must show. There's no intentionality in that email. There's nothing purposeful. Um, at most, that email- Is the, the corroboration that is required, how extensive is the corroboration requirement? Uh, if you take us, uh, what I take you to have acknowledged, which is, at least in principle, the corroboration the corroborating evidence can itself be out of court statements. Um, do, do all of the, does there have to be corroboration as to every element of the showing that the employer needs to make? Could there be, you know, corroboration uh, only in part? So for example, I mean, it does seem as though the email 
from uh, Ms. Smith acknowledges that a child was out of the classroom. Uh, that corroborates an aspect of what the employer needs to show. Uh, is that enough? Uh, or would it have to, does the corroboration have to extend to uh, questions of culpability rather than just like the, the, the event happened, that's undisputed. There is a, you know, there, there's not necessarily corroboration as to, you know, whether there was any culpability. Well, the heart of the issue here would be whether, whether Centronia proved misconduct. And misconduct is not just a simple act of negligence or a mistake made by an employee, even if that mistake can get the employee fired. Understood, and that's why I'm asking you whether you think corroboration has to extend to all the components of a showing of misconduct, or whether it's enough that there's corroboration as to part of what the employer needs to show. I think the corroboration needs to go to the, to the misconduct itself. And well, I, again, just... that, that seems a little ambiguous. Uh, you mean all uh, enough? There has to there has to be corroboration as to everything that is essential to a showing of misconduct. Is that what you mean? Well, well there needs to be substantial evidence of misconduct, and so if it's going to be corroborating evidence, it must corroborate the what um, what the employer has to prove, and that is. Well, so let me just so, so for example, imagine in this case there had been Mr. Velasquez's statement and Ms. Uh, Smith's uh, statement, and then there was a video showing the two children out of the classroom. Uh, would that be corroboration, uh, a reliable corroboration that would allow an ALJ to look at the rest of the uh, uh, prior statements and written documents and find uh, sufficient evidence, or would it not be because it shows that the children are out of the classroom, but it doesn't uh, corroborate the a key issue, which is who was at fault for that problem? It would obviously depend on what the video actually showed, but uh, just showing two, two children out of the classroom, I don't think would corroborate, um, you know, the, uh, whether, whether misconduct was proven. So as a matter of law, you think if that had been the record, an ALJ could not have found misconduct because the ALJ would have to interpret this regulation as saying, that's really not the kind of reliable corroborating evidence that is required it's got to corroborate, you know, more of what is needed to make a showing of uh, 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 misconduct, including yeah, the culpability of the uh, 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 employee. Correct. And I, I guess I, I do you are you aware of? I mean, there are corroboration requirements in other areas of law. Uh, in some areas, of, there, and there used to be more in criminal law. Some of them are, are, are by the wayside now, but there are some. Uh, and uh, they don't, well, I don't know about generally, but at least some of them don't have the character you're describing. And they, will, they do permit corroboration to be partial in character rather than having to go to all of the elements of what needs to be shown. Are you aware of, uh, uh, I mean, what makes you say that the corroboration has to extend to kind of, I, if I'm fairly characterizing your argument, kind of the critical components of the misconduct? What, it, what, why would, is that, are you aware of legal support for that idea? Well, it, it goes back in the, in the particular context of misconduct hearings, it goes back to you know, what the purpose of the unemployment benefits regulation is and what the employer is, what needs to prove to, to overcome the presumption that an employee is qualified for benefits. So the employer really has the burden to show that it wasn't just that a rule was violated in this case, but that Ms. Smith intentionally did that, intentionally disregarded the employer's, um, you know, the, the employer's uh, best interests in, in, and it really goes to the, the whole idea of the misconduct statute and regulations to begin with is really, you know, showing that the, did the employee do something purposefully to get fired, to take advantage of unemployment benefits? And in this case, there, even a video of two children in the hall wouldn't come close to showing that. Um, and that's why really there is an emphasis placed on live testimony in these misconduct situations where where there's context and there, the intentionality of the employee is really, um, is really at issue. And here there's been absolutely no evidence, hearsay or otherwise, of anything like that.
Anything further, Ms. Hallams? No, Your Honors, if there are no further questions, legal aid requests that the court affirm the ALJ's decision. All right, thank you. Um, Ms. Morrison, um, we reserved a couple minutes of rebuttal time for you. Thank you Ms. very Morrison, much. Can I just jump in and ask you, is, is part of the problem, the reason we're struggling with the ALJ's order, um, because the argument that was made to the ALJ just didn't really follow the framework of 312.10. I'm looking at the transcript of um, Centronia's closing on pages 54 and 55. Um, and, you know, after putting in all of the documents um, into evidence, all the employer's representative says is, look, we think we were justified in firing Ms. Smith. That's on the bottom of page 54. And then Ms. Jenkins says, there was a witness that witnessed two children being left alone unattended and having left the classroom while she was present. Presumably she, she's referring to Mr. Velasquez. Mm -hmm. And then she says, we have Aussie regulations, we have the employee manual, she was trained, um, and you know this was unacceptable. Um, and she knew there was grounds for termination. There's no, there's no argument by the employer, here's a, yes, we're under 312.10, we're supposed to put in, or we, under 312.8, we have the burden of proof, Here's our prior uh, statements or written documents, but we think they're corroborated. Um, it's just not there. Um, and so the ALJ says, yeah, you said there was a witness. You didn't bring that witness. You just brought Ms. Jenkins. That's not gonna fly under 312.10. Not seeing the argument that you've made in your brief or that you've made today being made to the ALJ, I guess. Well, the argument that was made to the ALJ was that there's sufficient evidence of misconduct. Um, and if you, and I want res to, in responding to your question, kind of pull on a thread from legal aid, there's a distinction between a finding of gross misconduct and misconduct for disqualification of employment benefits. So there doesn't have to be only extreme willful misconduct. That's gross misconduct. But under 312.6, there can be, other than gross misconduct, you can have minor violations of employer rules. That is a, can be a, fine, a basis for misconduct to disqualify you from um, unemployment benefits. Here, I don't think this is a, just a minor violation of the rules, but I think the argument that Centronia was making was that here you have an individual who, um, we have these rules, they stem from Aussie license regulations that you can't leave children unattended. Um, and uh, under 312.7, if there is disqualification or if the argument is a, the violation of an employer's rules, you have to show that the rule was known to the employee, the rule was reasonable, and it was consistently enforced. And I think what Centronia is trying to argue here is that, um, you know, there's a violation of Aussie license regulations, right? And that's the basis for the misconduct. We don't have to show that it was intentional, that it's willful, that it's extreme. Right. Aussie has these- Right, but I'm trying to stick to the ALJ's order, mm -hmm. right? Which you are arguing was flawed, right? Right. And, I um, and so I, what I'm positing is that the way the argument was presented to the ALJ was, hey, someone saw this presumably a reference to Mr. Velasquez, who the employer did not bring to court. Right. And then there's an argument of, and what this person who is not here saw violated rules. And the ALJ said, well, there's 312.10 that says you can't do this all with documents, right? There's, there's never a point where the employer says, look, we know we're giving you a lot of documents, but we think we're complying with the regs because we think that we have Mr. Velasquez and his, um, his hearsay report is corroborated. And so ALJ, find for us. 
Right. right. I, mean, I, I agree with you that Centronia is not affirmatively invoking 312.10 in this evidentiary hearing. They presented all of their evidence um, and, and earlier in the hearing on page. Not eight, even not invoking 312.10, never invoking Ms. Smith's email, never invoking oh. her signing of the corrective action report, which actually doesn't have anything to do with this day and has something to do with the next day. That's not in the closing argument. It's just we have Mr. Velasquez and we have rules. So, actually, so there's no there's no conversation about corroboration whatsoever. Well, on page 18 of the transcript, Ms. Jenkins had already previously explained to the ALJ what she wanted the ALJ to take from Ms. Smith's email. So the ALJ had already addressed that. That point had already been addressed, and it's actually it's a quite short hearing. It only did not last for very long. But um, on page 18, um, Ms. Jenkins does explain what she what should be taken from Ms. Smith's email, namely that um, Ms. Smith admits to seeing a, a child being left unsupervised and that she didn't go after the child. Um, right, but so when she's summarizing sort of the evidence that supports her case, which is in closing argument, she doesn't reference that. Right. Summation is usually where you tell the fact finder, this is how we have carried our burden of proof and this is why you should fight for us. Yes, I, I understand. I agree with that. I mean, that's reflected in the transcript, but I think six minutes or not even six minutes earlier, the whole hearing lasted less than 10 minutes. You know, she had just explained um, why the email was relevant. Um, but I, you know, I don't know what was in Ms. Jenkins' head, but it's accurate reflection of the transcript that she didn't, again, make reference to that email. But I don't think that uh, the closing statement takes away from the evidence itself or the fact that 312.10 doesn't say you can't rely on hearsay evidence. And the ALJ just never made any analysis of the documents. She simply said it, they weren't corroborated by Ms. Jenkins, um, but that is to suggest hearsay can't be reliable. And that's not what the regulation says. So I think at the very least, the ALJ should have met, made an independent evaluation of the evidence that was admitted. And I, ALJ, you know, and Centronia was not put on notice that the ALJ wasn't going to consider any of this evidence, right? The ALJ admitted all of this evidence. You know, so it, and it was only in the order that she elected, I mean, really just to disregard all of the well, evidence. I guess it goes back to what you think it means not to consider. I mean, you know, well, she, she didn't admit them no into idea. evidence, and then she looks at the regulations, which presumably Centronia is familiar with before they go to these hearings, right? That's why the regulations exist, to put everybody on notice how these things work. The employer has the burden of proof. The employer is supposed to bring witnesses to be available to questioning. The employer can't rely on prior statements and written documents unless those documents are corroborated. And so knowing those rules, one would assume that an employer would prepare for the hearing and understand that they need to satisfy those requirements, right? And, and it just seems to me that in closing, what the employer says is, we have Mr. Velasquez's out of court statement and we have rules that show that what he says happened was a rule violation. I agree that that is what the closing argument is, but the ALJ is supposed to make an evaluation of the evidence that was admitted. And the ALJ just simply says she needs no findings of fact, doesn't draw any legal conclusions on the documentary evidence for the sole basis that Ms. Jenkins didn't have firsthand knowledge of the, um, firsthand knowledge of the misconduct. So I think the analysis in the ALJ's de decision is deficient. And in some, it does not follow the regulation because there's no evaluation, there's no analysis of what it means to be reliable corroborating evidence and whether that can't be hearsay. She seems to suggest that this other reliable evidence can't be hearsay, but that's not what the reg says, right? The reg, the reg doesn't, doesn't say anything about hearsay whatsoever. Say anything, right, whatsoever, but it doesn't exclude hearsay. 
And case law does say that you can rely on hearsay in these unemployment benefit hearings. I don't have any further questions. All right, thank you. Um, um, I'd like to thank the parties for your briefs and arguments. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the Legal Aid Society for uh, entering an amicus brief and presenting arguments today. And uh, thank you, Ms. Smith, for appearing and giving the court your statement. Um, so we will uh, take the matter under advisement and uh, we're going to take a short um, recess and uh, return uh, in about five or 10 minutes to do the third and final case with a different panel. Thanks everyone and have a good rest of the day. This court is now back in session. Please come to order. All right. Um, it's almost afternoon, so good good afternoon, almost. Um, this is the case of Karome, is it Karome or Karomi? Rome. This is the case of Karome versus Karome. Um, uh, will both counsel be arguing um, pro se? Both parties be arguing pro se? I'm sorry, Ms. Khan is arguing on behalf of the appellant, Asla Karam. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Are the parties ready to proceed? Yes, we are. Yes, Your Honors. Good morning, almost afternoon, and may it please the court. I am Aisha Khan, and I am here on behalf of the appellant, Asla Karam. I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. This case arises out of my client's long-standing efforts to obtain a civil protection order against her now ex-husband. After the trial court initially denied her a civil protection order in 2018, this court reversed and remanded. On remand, the trial court again denied a civil protection order. And I'd like to focus here on what I think are two straightforward legal errors reflected in that denial. The first was the trial court's disregard of this court's very straightforward in instruction to make additional findings of fact and conclusions of law regarding the alleged malicious destruction of property offense and I'm quoting, and prior similar conduct by Mr. Carone. The court did not do that. It focused exclusively on um, events that were pled, that the court uh, thought were pled in the petition and disregarding. Ms. Ms. Khan, Ms. Khan, yes. Ms. Khan just, just to clarify that on remand, uh, the trial court did um, focus on the malicious destruction of property involving uh, Ms. Carome's bonsai plant collection. So could, could we start with that argument and, and you uh, tell us why you think there was error with how the trial court um, ultimately found that there wasn't a sufficient basis to find that malicious destruction of property occurred here? No, Your Honor, I, I'll have to correct the premise. On remand, the trial court did not look at the bonsai incident. And that is one of the grounds of error. This court in its 2019 uh, decision did discuss the bonsai incident. And it's very clear from that opinion that this court's reference to the prior similar conduct that the trial court needed to consider on remand encompassed the bonsai incident. The bonsai incident was not- You know what, Ms. Ms. Khanna, thank you for that clarification. That, that's my, my misstatement. We were talking about the, the destruction of the, the porcelain items, I believe, um, that, that the trial judge considered on remand and determined that that was not a sufficient uh, predicate offense to establish malicious um, destruction of property. What was her error there in your view? 
Her error was that in concluding that the October 10th, 2017 incident did not occur as my client um, said it did, re uh, rested on her failure to consider prior similar conduct. So this court's instruction- So, on so just, just to, just, I'm sorry to keep interrupting. What the trial court found was that um, there was some mitigating circumstances surrounding the destruction of the porcelain item. Is that correct, right? Yes, And, and therefore, therefore, uh, no, no, no defense or explanation to counter the mitigating circumstances in her view, in the trial judge's view. And you're saying that that determination was not correct because of her failure to consider other prior instances. Yes, Your Honor. The decision about that incident was made in a vacuum. And this court has been very clear, not just in the remand, but in its longstanding series of cases about the relevance of mosaic evidence, what the court has referred to as mosaic evidence, which the court has characterized to include events that predated the filing and events that may have post-dated the filing. It did that in Cruz versus Foster. And it did that very recently in a judge written by your honor, Ramirez versus Salvatera, which I did cite to the court as supplemental authority in a recent submission. Right, and I'm very interested in, in the, your view as to the ap applicability of Ramirez in this context. Um, um, in, uh, you filed a, a supplemental authority saying that Ramirez was applicable uh, be, and in Ramirez, we do talk extensively about the importance of uh, the entire mosaic of the evidence. Um, uh, uh, Pelly contends that Ramirez is not applicable because in Ramirez, we were looking at the um, extension of an existing civil protection order and whether or not under the statute, it should be extended for an additional year. Here, we're talking about the initial instatement or issuance of the civil protection order. Is that something that would make uh, Ramirez inapplicable here? Because we don't really, we talk about the similar standards of good cause for issuing a civil protection order in Ramirez and its similarity to the standard for good cause to extend the civil protection order. Um, is that a distinction that makes Ramirez relevant or irrelevant in this context? I think Ramirez is directly relevant. And I wanna quote from the slip opinion at page 21. We have held that the same procedural features apply to extensions of CPOs that apply to the initial issuance of CPOs. At page 32 to 33, the court cited cases in both categories, meaning both initial issuance and extensions for the following principle, quote, Good cause, the good cause determination must take into account the entire mosaic of the case, which encompasses the full history of the party's relationship and interaction. That also follows on the heels of Ramirez II, which was a preceding decision by this court that arose after the initial issuance of the CPO, which the, uh, the, the respondent challenged on appeal and what the Ramirez III court called Ramirez II. And in that, that's 111A3-1032. And at page 1037 of the decision, the court said, um, prior acts uh, that were committed by the respondent support good cause, it affirmed, that because prior acts supported the good cause determination to believe that there was an intrafamily offense. Well, well here, um, um, I just want to, you know, we, we we talk about this entire mosaic, um, which as Ramirez states is important, it, it is relevant. But, you, but we are also careful in Ramirez to talk about the need for the, the predicate offense, finding an, a predicate offense. And your argument is that perhaps the trial judge would have, if I'm understanding it correctly, perhaps the trial judge would have differently evaluated Ms. Caron's credibility, which she found, she found her not credible, would have differently evaluated her credibility 
had the trial judge appropriately considered the entire mosaic or the, which you did attempt to raise before the uh, or trial counsel, I believe you were trial counsel as well, did attempt to, um, no, not you, I'm sorry. Trial counsel did attempt to raise before the trial court and the trial court on remand and the trial court said, no, we're not gonna consider that. Is that your argument? And, and if so, what other mosaic evidence are you arguing would have impacted on the trial court's legal determination that this um, destruction of property offense did or did not occur? There are a few questions that I perceived in that. I think the-, the Very, very uh, perceptive. I'm <laughs> trying to but sort of what, focus my question really, there. <laughs> let, me, let me try to say it in a nutshell. The court decided on remand that there was no malicious destruction of property in a vacuum meaning it considered neither preceding incidents of which there was the bonsai incident, a 2013 incident of destruction of property, nor did it consider subsequent events that had post-dated the initial trial. And those in included the smashing of doors at the house, the breaking of, of the, the trim around doors, the theft of my client's license plate off her car after- uh, Well, but, but how is that relevant to whether or not the porcelain toothbrush holder, I believe it was, was destroyed maliciously? Because it goes directly to malice. So I'd like to draw on criminal cases, for example. I mean, after all, an inter interfamily offense is defined as a criminal offense against a petitioner. It is abundantly clear in the criminal context that prior incidents are relevant to an assessment of whether the actions were taken with malice or were instead taken by accident, by provocation, by self-defense. And I wanna uh, point the court both to Clark versus United States, which we did cite to the court extensively in our reply brief on that very point, but also to Garibay versus United States, which is 634 A second at 946, where the husband claimed an assault was reactive. And this court held that the evidence of a prior assault was relevant to showing whether the husband acted with malice or reactively. And that's exactly how my client has sought to use both preceding and subsequent events. Ms. Now, were Tons, those preceding like events ask. pled in, in the initial, I apologize, in the initial um, complaint? Yes, Your Honor, the preceding events were, of course, the, the subsequent events were not uh, because they had not occurred at the time the CPO petition was filed. But the plaintiff at that, uh, the petitioner, excuse me, at that point was pro se, a domestic violence clerk wrote her <coughs> petition and it mentions both the uh, December 2016 assault, a, uh, the, the, what the court's referring to as the porcelain toothbrush holder incident of October, 2017, as well as the 2013 incident and the, um, the, the, the bonsai incident. I wanna also uh, let the court know that the reliance on earlier uh, incidents also shows up in child abuse cases. And- Council? Before you move on, I, I want to make sure I uh, understand a, a component of the procedural posture here. On remand, uh, and, and I think there are two different theories that you have been uh, identified, you've identified, and I want to just separate them and then ask you the procedural question about both. One is the theory that the bonsai incident itself was included in the complaint and was presented to the trial judge really as a possible independent predicate for a conclusion that there was an interfamily offense. So that, that's one. Then the other is that in determining whether or not who to credit with respect to the, the, the bathroom uh, toiletries incident, uh, the trial court ought to have considered both the prior and the subsequent circumstances. And I just wanna make sure, is, is it your uh, position that on remand, uh, counsel for your client clearly articulated to the trial judge both of those two ideas. First, judge, uh, whatever you think about the bathroom incident, there's the bonsai incident, and that could itself be, in fact, the intrafamily offense. Was that ever presented to the trial judge, and if so, where, on remand? 
um, A, and B, the idea that the prior incidents and the subsequent incidents were relevant to credibility as to the bathroom incident. Was that ever presented to the trial court in Issaware? So All forgive right. me, forgive me, Your Honor, if I don't get to both questions and get sidelined, please do jump in and remind me. But on the predicate, whether the bonsai incident was uh, pled as a predicate offense. I, I, my question is not whether it was pled. My question is whether ever anybody ever said to the trial judge, judge, rely on that as a, a predicate, uh, a separate predicate offense. So, Your Honor, I, I'll point you to uh, the supplemental joint appendix at pages 26 to 29, and that is during the oral argument on remand. And the counsel for the petitioner made it abundantly clear that her position was that this was a pattern and that the pattern was made up of a series of events. And that's consistent with this court's uh, statements in the 2019 remand opinion that malicious destruction of property is an intra-family offense when it reflects, there, there, there are several contexts in which it can be an intra-family offense, but one of them is that it reflects a pattern of the exercise of uh, domination and control. And that is the realm in which the attorney made it very clear the petitioner was proceeding at those pages. And in fact- Well, that sounds a little, to me, that sounds a little vague on the question of whether the trial judge should have understood that the, uh, uh, that whatever, uh, th that there was a request to independently consider whether the, um, uh, uh, the bonsai incident could serve as a predicate. Because the trial court didn't consider that at all. Uh, I mean, it didn't even say, I'm not going to consider it. The trial court didn't seem to be aware Ignored that there was it. an argument that was being made to it. And I, I, you, you've said there were kind of general references to patterns and the like, but that's pretty ambiguous as to whether anybody is saying, wait a minute, Judge, there's, I have two different predicate offenses here. One of them is the bonsai incident. One of them is the toiletry incident. Uh, is there anything that's more specific or concrete that would have put the trial court on notice? Because the trial court didn't seem to be aware that that was a theory being submitted to it because it didn't address it at all. Well, this court did in its 2019 remand order made it abundantly clear. As an independent, uh, that it could be an independent predicate for, a, 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 you know, the, the bonsai incident was kind of, uh, that one of the jobs of the trial judge on remand would be to consider whether the bonsai incident could be an independent uh, predicate for a CPL? Your Honor, in 2019, you said a pattern is what matters. On remand, I would encourage the court to read the pages 26 to 29. There was nothing unclear or ambiguous about my petitioner's position. Ms. Khan, I beg to differ with you on that. I did read those pages of the transcript on remand. And it seems to me that counsel was arguing that if, in effect, if you find that the destruction of the um, toothbrush holder was, a, was, a, was an intra-family offense, malicious destruction of property, then, because the judge was asking counsel, why should, what is the, what am I supposed to do with regard to these other matters? Then those other matters are relevant in determining whether there should be a CPO issue. But counsel, in my view, never asked the judge to, con to consider any of those other matters, either the ones before October 17th or the ones after October 17th as relevant to determining whether the destruction of the porcelain toothbrush holder constituted an intra-family offense. Counsel took the position it did on its own. The judge disagreed. And, and furthermore, as I read that transcript, counsel for Ms. Carome never invited the judge to find that any other incident, the bonsai destruction incident or any other incident constituted a what's been called a, here a predicate offense to support the issuance of a CPO. That argument was never made in my opinion. And so to me, the argument that you're making now seems to be one that was not made to the trial court. 
on either of the two prongs that Judge McLeese um, asked you about. And I don't see anything in the pages that you um, referred to um, as um, supporting a contrary view. So, Your Honor, I am having a little trouble locating it. I'd appreciate the opportunity perhaps to point the court to it after the argument, or perhaps I'll find it during Mr. Caron's presentation. But what the uh, lawyer said on remand is that the October 10th, 2017 incident is not sufficient to establish uh, a, an intrafamily offense, that the court had to look at the preceding incidents and the post incidents. So to some extent, this is a red, this is a distraction or a red herring because there is no doubt that those prior incidents were addressed, the prior incidents were made central to her case, that they are pled and that um, they are at a minimum relevant as mosaic evidence for the incident of October 10th, 2017. Well, let me ask, let me follow up my question then and ask you this. Um, suppose the judge was considering all that other evidence. It's a little hard for me to see how any of that other evidence or all of it would have led the judge to think that the destruction to conclude that the judge that the destruction of the porcelain toothbrush holder on in October 2017 constituted malicious destruction of property because the judge's analysis of that accepted the fact that Mr. Carome destroyed the toothbrush holder and found that he only did so after Ms. Carome had previous had just destroyed a fair amount of his property in his bathroom and so provoked him that he went in and in a little tit for tat um, destroyed um, her property. He found all the judge, not he, the judge found uh, all the facts and concluded that they did not, did not in and of themselves arise to the level of malicious destruction of property. And on appeal, in your initial brief, you don't argue that the judge got that law wrong the law of malicious destruction of property. I realize you raised it for the first time in your reply brief, but that comes too late. The problem, Your Honor, is that whether or not this was done out of provocation and whether or not um, who was telling the truth is itself what this court has said has to turn on mosaic evidence. So in Cruz versus Foster, for example, the court made a credibility determination in a vacuum. And the court said, you can't do that. And I want to point the court to a subject. If I could just interrupt you, I don't think I disagree with you in principle that other evidence, mosaic evidence, other crimes evidence, whatever you want to call it, can bear, can in theory, bear on issues of credibility and the like. But you have two problems here. One is that on remand, that argument was never made to the judge. And, and number two, um, in the first appeal, we upheld the judge's credibility determination, and that's the law of the case. The judge found initially all the things that had happened. She did not believe uh, Ms. Carone. The evidence supported that finding, and we upheld it in the first appeal. So I don't really see the issue. You'd have to explain to me why the issue of uh, your client's credibility is still before us in this appeal. Your Honor, this court upheld the credibility finding with respect to the assault. It did not opine on credibility with respect to malicious destruction of property. And it, it said uh, Mr. Carone had actually admitted some of that. And so the court remanded for the trial court to make additional findings of fact and conclusions of law. Well, it, it may did not take credibility off the table. The credibility issue is whether the credibility issue is whether Ms. Carone um, accidentally um, damaged or destroyed Mr. Carone's property or whether she did so on purpose. And the judge found she did so on purpose. That was part of her credibility determinations that we upheld on the direct appeal. The credibility went not just to what she did, but what he did, meaning the, an important aspect here is whether there was malice in Mr. Carone's actions. And it's that consideration that this court has said uh, mosaic evidence must be considered. And I, I cited the court to 
criminal court cases in which the court has made that abundantly clear. And I also want to point the court to th these parties have since become divorced. And Judge Nooter, another trial, another judge of the DC Superior Court issued a, a, a finding that, and I, I'm going to quote, that Mr. Carone's testimony was incredible and clearly false. And that was about included uh, testimony about the night that led to this civil protection order incident. Counsel, can I just interrupt? I, I assume you're referring to things that are not part of the record in this case? I am, Your Honor. I'm occurring to, I'm referring to a subsequent decision by Judge well, I mean, or, Ordinarily, we're not in a position to consider matters that are not in the record in the trial court of this case or in front of us. Are you asking us to take judicial notice of uh, the credibility finding in the other matter? Or why are, why, are, why are you, why do you think it's appropriate to be mentioning uh, that material uh, at argument today? Yes, Your Honor. I would ask the court to take judicial notice because I think it bears on the credibility of Mr. Carome and it shows how the trial judge in this case has really bent over backwards to ignore um, all of the testimony, all of the evidence that cut against Mr. Carome. Um, it ignored the preceding incidents uh, here of malicious destruction of property. It ignored malicious destruction of property in its entirety. In, in the first decision. Um, and so I, I think the credibility, and ignored obviously all these other incidents and subsequent incidents in making that credibility determination. And so I, I do think there's some reasons to look um, with some uh, jaundiced eye at that determination. And again, my position is that it is bound up uh, with the provocation and the credibility are all bound up with what and the earlier incidents and subsequent incidents are all bound up with whether there was good cause to believe an intrafamily offense occurred. And I see, I believe, although I'm having a little trouble seeing it, that my time uh, is up. I would like to reserve the balance for rebuttal unless the court has questions right now. Okay, yes, we, we took you a bit over your time with our questions, but we'll um, reserve some time for a couple minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, thank you. Okay. Good Mr. afternoon. Carone? Thank you, your Chief Judge. Uh, good afternoon, Your Honors. My name is Pat Carome. I'm representing myself pro se here. Uh, in this oral argument, uh, I'd like to focus on four fundamental points, if I have time. First, more than anything else, this appeal turns on the trial court's finding that Ms. Carome's uh, testimony about what happened on the morning of October 10th, 2017 was simply not true. The trial court specifically stated, quote, Ms. Carome's testimony as to the entire course of events on October 10th, 2017 is not credible. This court ruled, as, as Judge Glickman pointed out, uh, that these sorts of uh, credibility determinations, credibility-laden determinations by the trial court are really not something that can be second-guessed uh, on appeal. And, and I, I do think Judge Glickman is correct. That, that, that Mr. Really Coroma, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we get, I'm you. hearing a lot of feedback, and I wondered if, um, uh, Ms. Khan, if you could mute uh, your uh, self during this part of the argument, and, and we'll try to keep ourselves muted unless we're asking or about to ask questions. Thank you, Your Honor. Should I go back and, and uh, to where I was before, or should I just, do you, do you want me to repeat oh, you, anything? No, I think you can, can keep moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this court has already ruled that, that these credibility determinations, um, uh, you know, with respect to the, you know, the, the, the false accusation that I assaulted Ms. Carome, I mean, that's not something that can be second guessed that Judge Raffinen, uh, saw the parties for three days, saw our demeanor, everything else, and, and made an assessment about who was telling the truth and who wasn't. Um, and so there's not, it's not just a question about credibility here on, uh, uh, on what happened with the toothbrush holder incident. Yes, Ms. Carone's uh, account and my account were, were, were diametrically opposed as to whether I was provoked or not. Um, but there Mr. was, Carone. there was, can I ask a, a question, um, not directly about the porcelain 
toothbrush holder, but about the bonsai incident. Yes. To make sure I'm understanding your argument as to why the bonsai incident wasn't um, fair uh, uh, game, so to speak, for the trial judge to consider as a possible predicate crime, particularly um, when I believe that incident may have been corroborated by one other witness, I believe uh, your son. No, um, I'm sorry. At the toothbrush. I, it, that, I, I admitted to the bonsai. Right, it's, it's, but, but, it's, but the trial that, judge never made a finding as to whether the bonsai incident could constitute a malicious destruction of pro, uh, uh, property and therefore serve as a predicate incident for the entry of, or to support the entry of a civil protection order. It, it was generally referenced, arguably, in, the, in Ms. Karom's complaint uh, what's your argument uh, uh, as to why that shouldn't have been considered or might not still be considered on remand if we decided to do that as a potential predicate offense here? Thank you, Honor. There are four reasons why the bonsai incident cannot be uh, treated as a predicate offense to support a CPO in this case. First of all, uh, this is I'll just do them in order. I'm, they're not all equally strong. But first of all, it was not alleged in the petition as a predicate criminal offense. You can look at the, it is well, referenced. I, can I ask you, it's, I mean, do you think there's a requirement that it be, uh, have a label of some kind? Or what is it that you think was lacking? It's referred to in the description of the circumstances that are laid out, yes. you know, by the summary. That it's in the summary paragraph, if I might. Uh, I'm, I apologize for interrupting um, uh, Judge McLeese. It says the respondent has also in the past destroyed petitioner's personal belongings. I'm reading from the CPO filed on October 12, 2017. Respondent has also in the past destroyed petitioner's personal belongings, including throwing her office items in the home office out the window and on the floor, as well as her potted plants. Um, and so those, you know, that's a general allegation. The bonsai were her potted plants, or at least among her pot, potted plants. Uh, so, so is is your? You said you were, you had four reasons, but yes. one of your reasons is that it wasn't the bonsai or destruction of the bonsai plants um, was not pr properly pled in the petition. Essentially, that's right. Yes, and, and this is not the best of, the, of my four arguments, but just to, to be clear, uh, Ms. Crum is a lawyer. That form is set up in a way where it clearly sets up um, uh, a very specific time, date, place, et cetera, allegations as to predicate offenses. Um, this was- Well, no, I'm not so sure. Uh, um, the not, if you look at this form, which is not a form that uh, is required to be filled out by attorneys and mostly isn't, um, it, it just says, uh, you know, very generally what, what, what happened. Please describe any such acts, including physical assault, shoving, kicking, threats to do harm, or destruction of property below. Doesn't say how detailed, and we've always talked about notice pleading to be sufficient doesn't have to be so detailed, but okay, I'm sorry. You have- Yeah, let me just say, I, you, you might want to move on. Yes, I'm going to move, I'm going to- uh, Yes. I will say that even if there was inadequate notice, I'm not sure how you would be prejudiced by it since during the course of the proceeding, you admitted to having done it. Uh, and so, you know, unless you had some later argument about why you would be prejudiced by it's being considered, I think you might want to move on to your second, third, and fourth points. Uh, thank you. At the, I will do so. A at the trial, the first, the, at the only trial, at the trial, uh, after the close of evidence, um, Ms. Ms. Karom's counsel did not present the, uh, uh, the bonsai incident as a predicate offense. She, she uh, on, uh, that, that counsel only argued that uh, uh, in closing that the uh, the incidents on October 10th were the predicate offenses and that the bonsai uh, incident uh, went to a pattern which would have gone to the question of whether or not 
in addition to being uh, a criminal offense, it was also an intrafamily offense and, uh, because that, that requires an offense on a person. And uh, so that's, it wasn't argued at the trial. Uh, second, um, uh, as, as Judge McLeese, you, you noted, uh, and I think Judge Glickman as well, it, this was definitely not presented as a predicate offense on remand when uh, the, the Judge Raffinan held a hearing specifically to understand what was her task uh, on remand. Um, the, um, uh, I would point in, uh, in particular uh, to uh, uh, pages SJ 832 and 33 uh, of the record um, where uh, uh, Judge Nash, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it was, it was Judge Nash was, was Ms. Ms. Carome's counsel, former Judge Nash. He said that first, there is a predicate offense under the Intrafamily uh, Offense Act, and secondly, there is the good cause. And that second is kind of a more amorphous analysis, but it is in that posture that the court is asked to look at the mosaic relationship. And he went on to specifically refer to the, uh, the toothbrush uh, holder incident as the uh, predicate offense, as the offense in question, and he re repeatedly referred to uh, the uh, prior episodes or or, or, or post-dated episodes, not uh, as as uh, additional possible predicate offenses, but only as uh, uh, things that could go to good cause or or possibly whether it was an offense upon a person, uh, and not at all. Uh, as to uh, suggesting anything about there being a, a, uh, a, an additional predicate offense. Um, also, the, I think a, f a fair reading of this court's prior opinion on the prior appeal in this case uh, makes fairly clear that it too uh, saw the uh, potential uh, criminal predicate offense at issue uh, on remand as, as simply the, the toothbrush holder incident uh, and not, and, and that it understood that um, the prior episodes, the alleged prior episodes were, um, were potentially related to uh, later steps of the uh, analysis in determining whether there's a basis for a CPO. You know, uh, on the question Mr. Carole, of, yes. Mr. Carole, I'm sorry. You're, I think the, the, the argument that you just made goes to uh, some of what you referenced in your um, supplemental authority letter citing us to the Ramirez case. And yes. you, you view it um, differently than uh, Ms. Khan does. Um, so just to uh, make sure I'm clear on your your analysis of how and if uh, Ramirez should apply. Your thought is that the entire mosaic consideration does not come in at the point that the, the trial court is trying to determine whether there's a predicate offense. Is that, is that what you're saying? Exactly. Uh, How do you um, respond to the, uh, I guess, when I believe it was Judge McLeese's question of Ms. Khan uh, when, when about uh, there are other contexts in the criminal context where we look at uh, um, you know prior history, other other crimes evidence in certain instances, and in the GLEC cases we look at the prior history of the family. Um, uh, wh why isn't that relevant, particularly in the domestic violence context, where um, we have heard. Uh, it argued in some cases that what might seem to be a benign incident when it's uh, viewed in the context of the entire mosaic, quote unquote, of the party's relationship might take on a, a different uh, light. And so that that context is important in evaluating evidence to determine whether there's a predicate offense. I, I don't think my, I don't think my <clears throat> position uh, needs to be that prior evidence can never, uh, evidence of prior episodes can never be relevant in assessing whether a, a particular criminal offense occurred. That's, that, that doesn't need to be my argument. I don't think it is, is what I'm arguing. Here, this was a very simple set of facts. 
uh, on, uh, as, to, as to this toothbrush holder. There was no doubt that Ms. Carome provoked me uh, out of the blue. And you said was, well, there was no doubt. I thought that was, uh, you know, contested as between the, the, uh, the degree or nature of the, the provocation was uh, contested. And even if you were looking at this case in isolation, just imagine for a minute that you had been criminally charged with destruction of property uh, relating to that incident, and you had put on a provocation defense rather than having the trial court kind of raise it sua sponte. Uh, and then imagine that uh, uh, the prosecution had tried to put on evidence that rather than this being kind of a, a one-time response to adequate provocation relating to the destruction of uh, toiletries of yours, it was instead part of a, a pattern of prior and subsequent malicious destruction of property that, you know, the allegation was, the government was trying to prove that when you get angry, you destroy property maliciously and you did it before in the bonsai incident and then throwing things off of balconies and you did it later in various circumstances. Are you saying that the, that evidence would have been irrelevant here? In a, in, a, in a criminal trial like that, it would have been irrelevant and the judge could properly have excluded it? I'm not, I'm not sure what, what, the, what the right answer is to that question. What I am saying here is, is that Judge Raffinan analyzed, carefully analyzed the events of, of that morning, saw photographs of, the, uh, of my bathroom items, you know, 15 of them thrown off all over all over the floor those are in but the i guess the, the careful when i was if you're not answering the question i've asked I, 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 as it relates to this case i'm not sure how much it helps you if a trial judge considers 73 percent of the relevant evidence and conducts a careful analysis of it what weight should we put on that analysis if the trial court didn't erroneously didn't consider other relevant evidence that might have affected the analysis however careful it was based on the information in front of it so it, it seems as though your argument I, at first, I thought your argument was, in the context of a CPO, prior and subsequent evidence of this kind is categorically irrelevant. I gather from your answers today that you're not making that argument, and your argument instead is that it was irrelevant in the circumstances of this case. But if you're saying that it actually it might well have been relevant, if you you know in a hypothetical criminal case that would have uh, addressed the same issues, then I'm not sure why you think it wasn't relevant here. Uh, and if it was relevant here, then I'm not sure how much it helps you that the judge carefully analyzed the partial record it considered. First of all, of course, the, the, this wasn't a question of, of any evidence being excluded. The, um, Ms. Carome had a full opportunity to put on all the facts that she wanted about this episode. They were in the record. They were. They well, were... I, I, again, I, I, uh, I don't think that's quite right from her perspective. Her argument is that some of the evidence that is relevant to that issue was the after uh, uh, you know, acquired evidence relating to the later incidents. And she did not have a full opportunity to introduce that evidence. She wasn't even allowed, uh, her lawyer wasn't even allowed to describe all of it by a general characterization of the incident. And it ultimately got uh, relegated to simply mentioning dates of incidents. So your honor, I think that uh, in these simple facts, uh, this simple situation, Judge Raffinan, having decided that Ms. Carone's testimony was untruthful, that she, she was making false accusations, that she falsely claimed that, that she had merely accidentally uh, uh, knocked things over to start this, uh, this episode, that, that Judge Raffinan was able to, to say as to the simple question, did Mr. Carone commit the offense of malicious destruction of property on the morning of, of, of October 10th, 17th, no, he did not. He was provoked. There's, there's, it's indisputable that he was provoked from the, from, if not from the, first from my own testimony. It's, it's, it's the, the judge properly uh, uh, determined. Well, you keep losing me with the word indisputable because uh, one what witnesses can test the testimony that won't make anything indisputable. But, no, but, but, then, but then you also have the, you also then have the, the, the photographic evidence from the police of photos of my bathroom floor that uh, I testified and that you know no one contested was the results of what Ms. Carome did in my bathroom to start to start off this episode. So there, that's why I think it is indisputable that I was provoked. Um, 
And once, once that's the case, I think that um, there simply is no um, a predicate uh, uh, offense that was either argued um, at, at either at the original trial or the, the only possible predicate offense uh, after remand, I submit, was the toothbrush holder episode. Ms. Karom's counsel on remand only argued that the toothbrush holder was, uh, event was the only predicate offense. Mosaic evidence, the, the, the entire mosaic, yes, that, that there are good and salutary reasons why this court has repeatedly said that the judges analyzing domestic relations, uh, I mean, domestic violence cases should consider the, the, the entire mosaic. And I, in this case, there, uh, it, it doesn't come up at, at, the, at the stage of the analysis that Judge Raffinan decided on. I, I would submit that in this case, there are four analytical steps that, that Judge Raffinan would have had to have completed to have uh, entered a CPO against me. First, was there a, a, a criminal predicate offense? And because this criminal predicate offense is, is not a, is, is a property offense, there necessarily would be a second that inquiry. She decided the first case, there was no predicate offense. If she had found that there was a predicate offense in terms of the breakage of the toothbrush holder, there still would have been three more steps. And at each of those three steps, I would submit that mosaic evidence could have been considered. First, there would have been the question of, is this uh, property destruction offense a, uh, a intra-family offense, a, a criminal offense upon a person uh, within the definition of intra-family offense or against a person according to the 16,005C? Uh, um, I don't mean to interrupt your four reasons. I don't mean to interrupt. Well, I do mean to interrupt your four reasons, and I apologize for doing so, I guess. But I, I think it's undisputed that at later stages, the mosaic evidence would have been uh, relevant. So uh, can, what do you make of your opponent's argument that okay. whatever else is going on here, if you read the court's, this court's MOJ, it said to the trial court, make additional findings of fact and conclusions of law uh, with respect to the prior incident. And the trial judge didn't do that. So, you know, whatever else, you know, put it in whatever analytical context you want, there was a very clear directive to the trial court that the trial court failed to honor. What's your response to that? I think that um, that that statement in the uh, prior court decision comes up most closely and clearly in the last summary paragraph. I think the uh, the on the prior page, um, uh, there's a paragraph that I think lays out um, the analysis that the that this court understood would be appropriate on remand. I think that th this court referred to there being only. Um, a single act, uh, predicate act in question, and that I think the court anticipated, frankly, that only, only, it, 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 only if that act were proven to be a predicate criminal offense would any of the, uh, would there be any need to resolve, resolve the others. I, I would also note that Judge Raffinan... Just to make clear, are, are you saying that the sentence that I was referring to although it seems to require the judge, just category, trial judge on remand to categorically do something, didn't really, shouldn't be read as actually requiring that because in context uh, from the rest of the MOJ, the, 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 uh, the, the, our memorandum uh, opinion judgment, one can tell that it might not be necessary for the trial court to do that. And therefore the trial court was free to kind of do what, our, do what the logic of our opinion implies rather than what the text of our opinion stated? That is, that is in fact, a, 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 a significant part of my answer. I would also say that a significant part of my answer is that uh, the statute at issue here um, requires there to be a predicate criminal offense before there you, it is ever logical to get to um, uh, this entire mosaic kind, kind yeah, although that of, kind seems of to circle back around to your argument that the prior similar incidents aren't relevant to whether there was on the date in question the, the with respect to the bathroom uh, toiletries incident uh, whether there was or wasn't a criminal offense yes but I, and, I, and on that I guess I want to point the court to judge judge Raffinan's decision judge Raffinan uh, I'm looking at SJA 69. She, she, 
she, um, she's, she's talking about no new developments, but I think it's equally, um, equally applicable to prior events. That Judge Raffinan understood that given the facts as she found them, including the, I, I submit, indisputable fact that I was provoked, um, she could not find, and there would there, other uh, evidence about other earlier episodes or any later episodes could not change the fact that Ms. Carome did not prove by a preponderance of the evidence, which is her burden, that I committed the predicate criminal act of malicious destruction of property. Now, she didn't say that there could never be an instance when um, prior act evidence might um, uh, bear on a, a, a determination of, of whether a predicate criminal offense was committed or not. She, she was talking about having made all these findings, having found as a matter of fact that Ms. Carome had falsely accused me uh, 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 about really all of the events on that day. And- Mr. Carome, may I yes. interrupt you and ask you a couple or two, two or three precise factual Certainly. questions about this. Am I correct that at trial, and for that matter, after trial, there was never any, you never disputed the fact of the bonsai incident, the destruction of the bonsai plants. That's right. Is that correct? That's correct. So there was no, no actual factual dispute about that, and the judge knew what the evidence showed. Am yes. I correct that uh, our opinion never asked the judge to, never, whatever we said about making findings about other incidents, we never specifically said, consider the impact of the bonsai incident um, on your evaluation of the October 10th destruction of the uh, porcelain toothbrush holder. Correct. And am I correct that um, Ms. Carome and her counsel never specifically asked the judge either to find an, int an intra-family offense based on the bonsai incident or ever asked and, and, and <laughs> never asked the judge to um, find that the bonsai incident had any relevance whatsoever to whether th there was an intra-family offense committed on October 10th. That's essentially correct. I would make one small uh, quibble. I, I, I think that they took the position that perhaps, they, they, they never took the position that uh, the Banzai episode could have any impact whatsoever on whether I committed the criminal offense of malicious destruction of property. I think had that, had that crime been proven, which it was not, then um, I, I think that you know at that point, at maybe maybe pattern evidence might come well, in. Well, I, I understood their argument yeah. to be that if the crime on October 10th was proven, then that other evidence was relevant to determining whether it would be appropriate in these circumstances to issue a CPO. Exactly. And, and I think, yes. I certainly agree with that. And in fact, I agree that in principle, I'm not, I, I don't want to be understood as suggesting that in principle, other prior or for that matter, subsequent conduct might not be relevant to, whether, to the question in the abstract of whether um, on a particular date um, a crime was committed. But, but I don't see that, frankly, as the issue here. I see that it's very hard for me to see, frankly, how um, if the judge had said anything about the bonsai incident, it would have affected her conclusion as to what happened on October 10th. And, and I would submit that, that in fact, Judge Raffinan essentially said that in the closing paragraph of her I second. think she essentially did. And I think she never received a contrary argument from counsel to the extent I'm aware of it. That, that's absolutely correct, Your Honor. Oh, but Mr. Carom, the, the, uh, this court's order remanding the case back to uh, Judge Raffinan talks about the uh, toothbrush holder incident uh, this, uh, and, and 
the need to determine whether that incident constituted malicious destruction of property. And then in, in the same statement says, and prior similar conduct. And certainly the bonsai, the destruction of um, the bonsai plants, which was, which you admitted to was arguably similar conduct relevant at least in determining whether or not it had any bearing on the destruction of the porcelain toothbrush incident. Why isn't that a fair uh, reading of the, uh, the, this court's remand order? Uh, I, I, I guess, as I, as I said before, when, when Judge McLeese asked a, a related question, that I think that that, that last paragraph of, of this court's uh, prior uh, decision in this case has to be read in the context of the fuller discussion uh, that happens on the prior two pages uh, and also has to be read in, in, in conjunction with uh, the statute which which says that um, uh, the a predicate criminal offense is the absolute sine qua non of any of any CPO and that just sets off a, a multi-step further analysis so I, I, uh, I think that, you know, Judge Raffinen worked very hard here. She, she, she on, on, on the first go round, she, she held a three day uh, 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 trial. She, she, she uh, took a lot of time to think about the, all the evidence. She said she considered all the evidence. She issued a, 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 a reasoned decision. This court found it incorrect in, uh, in failing to address one, one issue. Could you could you remind me? I, I'll just and is there a place in the record where Judge Raffinen says that anything about the bonsai event, or the, there's just the test? How how um, uh, was it, it through cross examination that that there was an admission about the bonsai incident? Or yes, it was. Did, the, the, she, the bonsai did she make any findings about the bonsai incident at all? I don't believe so, um, but she, um, but I do think that as as Judge Glickman was 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 saying a moment ago, that the analysis at the uh, last paragraph of Judge Raffinen's second decision in this case um, really states clearly that in these circumstances, evidence of other events on on in other years um, uh, wasn't didn't have the capacity to change uh, uh, the outcome uh, of, uh, uh, of, of her ruling that, that I did not commit the crime of malicious destruction of property on the morning of October 17th, 2010, 2017. Thank you, Mr. Karoum. Um, Thank you. Ms. Khan, uh, we've uh, reserved a couple of minutes for your rebuttal. I'm going to speak really quickly because I don't have a lot of time. Well, well like we haven't, well, hold on, hold on. We haven't started the clock yet. <laughs> you, you don't have to speak quite that quickly. Recent. <laughs> you have two <laughs> minutes for rebuttal if you give us a second or three or whatever. Sorry, sorry. I, I believe I had reserved three, Your Honor. Yes, three minutes. I'm sorry. Thank you. May I begin? Yes. I'd like to point the court to SJA 25. And that's where uh, Ms. Karom's counsel says, we understand that the particular <coughs> incident in question, which was the sweeping of the toiletries off the, 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 the counter, would not be sufficient, that the court needs to look at the pattern. Uh, the, the court herself understood this. And I'd like to point the court to SJA 30, where the court says, I understand in discussing what this court asked her to do, I understand that mosaic uh, evidence refers to, and I'm quoting here, the throwing of the item outside the window, the disposal of the bonsai plant, and the swiping of the objects. And she was saying the, she understood that. So for her, the only issue was whether the court needed to hold uh, a hearing about subsequent events that postdated the trial. Uh, I also want to speak to Mr. Carone saying that that last clause, prior similar conduct, was somehow a throwaway line. I'd like to point to SJA 17. 
And that's where this court said, uh, they talk about the preceding incidents. And they say, while the trial court should consider the entire mosaic of the party's relationship in determining the ultimate question of good cause, um, uh, so, sorry, let me actually start a little bit later. Mr. Carone's actions on a few occasions, one to four, wait, I am just reading in the wrong place. Sorry, SJA 18. Yet the judge's findings, this is about the error, failed to discuss this admitted conduct, or, and that's about the 1010 incident, the swiping, or explain why it did not establish the commission of an intrafamily offense and considered in conjunction with the entire mosaic, including any past destructive acts by Mr. Carone. So it is not a throwaway line. It was part and parcel. It was central to the court's analysis. I also want to emphasize what a red herring this is, because the court, this court has made it abundantly clear that it doesn't matter what the predicate offense. The courts never ever said, you don't need to look at preceding or post, post, excuse me, my water bottle, just, I'm getting so animated. The court has never said that you need to find a predicate offense before you look at pre or post incidents. It said quite the contrary. It said that, and, and Ramirez is the, the most straightforward uh, 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 sort of, you know, kind of uh, development of that proposition. Uh, so I think that sine qua non, the entire premise is flawed and would really jettison longstanding, the longstanding jurisprudence of this course um, about what is relevant in determining whether there's an intrafamily offense. I also want to talk about how we've kind of focused on this predicate offense in the bonsai incident, the October 10th, 2017 incident. And I want to mention the subsequent incidents because the trial court, as I, I read earlier, understood that the preceding incidents were in fact to be discussed on remand and then never spoke to why she ignored them in her written opinion. But the subsequent developments was what she held this hearing about. And I want to mention that that was a status conference. It was not an evidentiary hearing. Um, and so Ms. Carone never had an opportunity to fully develop all the incidents to which her counsel referred to demonstrate this pattern. And they include destruction of property that I mentioned earlier, the doors, the removal of the license plate after a trial judge in a civil proceeding said Mr. Carone was not entitled to Mrs. Carone's car. He took, the, he went to her house where he had vacated and took the license plate off her car. Um, and then thereafter that, involuntarily kissed Mrs. Carone's daughter during the day while Mrs. while the petitioner was out at work. Um, and these are the kinds of incidents that the petitioner wanted the court to consider to see the kind of malice that was behind Mr. Carone's actions. And it's the vast- Counselor, can I ask you, I think we have a sense of what the after required uh, or the, the subsequent developments were. I just wanted to ask you a question about the kind of recusal related topic that you had raised. I meant to do this in your opening argument. You had raised a concern about recusal and you asked the court to uh, uh, supplement the record with certain materials and that motion was denied. So we don't really have in front of us material relating to that concern. Um, have you uh, sought any relief in the trial court relating where, where perhaps a factual record could appropriately be made with respect to the concern you've had? on that score? Your Honor, the uh, disclosure from the judge about a relationship with Mr. Carone's trial counsel was made at the absolute tail end of the hearing on remand, meaning two years into the judge sitting on the case. And it counsel, I think I have a good sense of procedurally, you know, how it came up. I was, my question is just a, a pretty specific one about whether uh, because you know you were you raised a concern in this court, and the material you were relying on to raise that concern, we've decided isn't appropriately in front of, in front of us. So I was just asking, have you pursued any relief in the trial court with respect to that concern? No, Your Honor. Two things. Two points. The first well, I just made, before you make two points, I just want to make sure your answer is no. You have not. No, we have not, and okay, I don't think the you. trial court thank would you. have jurisdiction. This is on appeal. Um, the, what, what relief would we be asking for? The court to undo a decision that's now on appeal? I don't think there would be jurisdiction uh, for us to have proceeded before the...
the client would have had to come up before you in any respect. And there was a feeling that my petitioner, uh, my client, couldn't really get a fair hearing. I think there was enough to concern her about impartiality. And I also want to mention the reference to that relationship is not entirely extra record. Uh, the, the judge herself raised it. And she raised it in a way that alerted the parties that she, even she thought it should have been mentioned earlier. And I've quoted in my brief about how uh, the court put it, um, and I don't have it at the ready, uh, but she said, I probably should have mentioned it earlier. I think those, that was the language. And the Facebook postings that the court chose not to see, not to, to, to view, uh, were simply corroborative and explanatory. And part of the problem here is that the judge did not disclose the precise nature of the relationship, but she herself felt that it was worthy of disclosure. Um, so I hope that's responsive to your honor's question. And if the court has no uh, further questions, I, that concludes my argument. Thank you so much uh, for hearing us today. All right, we'd like to thank both parties for your uh, briefs and your arguments today. And at this time, uh, we'll take the matter under advisement. Thank you, your honors. Thank you. This court is now adjourned. <laughs>